office budget. That's a written briefing only. So we're moving straight into item two, which is the advice and consent uh, and the interview of director appointment for economic development, Lara Fritz. Uh, so come up to the table, Lara, and I understand that uh, Mayor Biskupski might want to introduce you. Yes. So uh, thank you, everyone. Um, we're very excited to be in front of you today to have this conversation. Uh, we did a very extensive search for um, finding, to find the right person to fill this role. We had well over 100 applications from all over the country. Um, and in our interview process, we used some local business owners to help us uh, make sure that we identified the right person to really have um, the background and the knowledge and the ability uh, to help move us forward in a way that helps our city grow in the best possible fashion and, and generate the revenue we need to run this city. So uh, with, without much more, uh, I do want to say welcome, Laura. And um, please take some time to introduce kind of your history. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you, council yeah, members. So Laura, Laura, that would yes. be great if we could have you um, just talk to us about uh, why, you're, why you're interested in Salt Lake City, your, your big vision plan, down to the most minute, whatever you feel like sharing, <laughs> and then we'll open it up here for council members to ask questions. Sounds perfect. Great. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. Well, thank you, council members, for having me. It's been a pleasure getting to know each of you over the past few hours. Um, I'm really excited to be here in Salt Lake City. Um, Mayor, thank you for your confidence in appointing me to this opportunity. Um, to the staff that I've met with, everybody has been so supportive and are passionate about making economic development a priority. And I've also had the pleasure of meeting stakeholders, and I'd like to thank the stakeholders in the community that have taken time out of their busy schedules the last couple of days to share with me their insights and philosophies on economic development. So with that, let me share a little background on who I am and how I ended up here today. Um, I'm very fortunate that I've spent 20 years in economic development. I have a master's in urban studies with an emphasis in economic development. I'm one of those few people that graduate in a major and actually do the work, so I, I'm really proud of that. Um, I've had the pleasure of teaching economic development at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee. Um, I am a certified economic development professional, which means that I have been approved by my peers as someone who is capable of doing economic development. Most importantly, I believe in lifelong learning, that economic development is constantly evolving, and I need to understand the greatest, the best practices that are out there. So lifelong learning is an important component for me. Having spent the majority of my career in economic development, my resume speaks for itself. I've had the opportunity to have many different opportunities. Each one of those opportunities gave me a new skill, and I'm looking forward to bringing those skills here to Salt Lake City. My key differentiators, I've done it. I've started economic development departments and organizations. And while this isn't truly a pure startup, and that the Redevelopment Authority and Arts Council and economic development have always been a part of the city structure, we're gonna take those wonderful divisions, encapsulate them under one roof, and we're gonna create a work plan to move forward. What do I view the mission of this department as being? Um, I view it as the opportunity to facilitate. Um, Salt Lake City is very diverse, and we want to make sure that the diversity is being addressed. Um, so we wanna maintain and grow our existing business base. And we're gonna accomplish that by working with both the partners internally and externally. Economic development cannot be done in a vacuum. And I want to make sure that our department is open and ready to work with partners both internally and externally. I want to promote Salt Lake City as a beautiful, authentic, and prosperous place to do business. And we're going to do that through what I sort of see of four key areas. The first being having a strong organization that's securely funded, dedicated to the future, with great staff out there doing good work. We want to be responsive, professional, accountable. And again, I'm using that word dedicated to the future. Economic development is not a one or two year process. 
It's a long term. It's a, it's a marathon, not a sprint. And so we want to be a, a cognizant of that. We want to do business development and do it well. Um, we're going to recruit, retain, expand, and help businesses get started. We want to be the glue that holds all of these wonderful resources that are out in the community together. We want to continue to make Salt Lake City a beautiful place. Um, it already is. So what we want to do is make sure that with the RDA and the Arts Council, that we're creating a sense of place that's special and unique and continues to build upon the beauty that's already here. We've talked independently, individually, about this, but we can do all this great work, right? We can go out and recruit, retain, expand, build new projects, but unless we're talking to people about it, it becomes sort of irrelevant. So we want to put forth a marketing initiative. Good news about marketing today is a lot of it can be done fairly inexpensively through websites, social media, and partnerships. So with that, if appointed, um, I see me working with the great staff of the RDA, the Arts Council, and Peter, who is economic development today, um, to develop tactics that go along with this initial vision that I've created um, that allow us to craft into a work plan um, very detailed tactics but more importantly, who's going to be responsible for them? How much resources does it take to accomplish it? And when are we going to get it done by? I'm going to want to work with the council to assure that we're developing metrics that you know that our department's accountable for. So with that, um, thank you again for having me here. And I look forward to answering any questions you may have. Great. Thank you very much, Laura. We appreciate that. Uh, Mr. Council Chair. Members? Yes, Lisa. Can I be the lead-off batter? You absolutely can. All right. Thank you so much for being with us, and thanks for taking time this morning to meet with those of us you had not had an opportunity to meet. And, Mayor, thank you for giving us such a great opportunity to hire someone who brings so much to the table for Salt Lake City. Thanks for your good job on the search. We are happy to have you here. I, as I warned you earlier, I'm the, <laughs> I'm the, I don't know, the chief inquisitor. I have a number of questions for you, and um, look forward to hearing your response. Starting off with, how do you define economic development? And since you majored in it, I <laughs> imagine you can give us a good definition, because so, I think a lot of people, it's kind of amorphous. Absolutely. That's a great question. I love that question, because uh, you're right. Economic development touches everything, but what is it really? Um, and what I view economic development as being is some of the things we've talked about in terms of my vision. It's business recruitment, retention, expansion, and helping them get started. It's creating a sense of place. It's creating jobs. It's adding tax base. Um, and it's promoting of the community. So that's what I feel economic development is. What, if, if you would say, break it down in percentages, what mm -hmm. percent would you see focused on developing local business, and what percent would be in bringing in out of, outside businesses into Salt Lake? Sure. Um, in terms of percentages, let's talk a little bit about why I think both are important. So the first is neighborhood commercial districts have a unique character. And what I think is, makes communities special are the sum of its neighborhoods. So we're going to absolutely have to look at the neighborhood level commercial districts. Partly because in order to recruit those larger companies, they're going to want to know their employees have a cool place to live and work and play. So it, it can't be isolated. So, you know, is it 30, 70, 50, 50 at this juncture? I'm not 100% sure, but I know that there's value to both, and we're going to be very dedicated to all businesses in the community. Do you believe in giving incentives to companies? And if so, what are the types of incentives you would see us offering? That's a great question. Um, I do believe that incentives can be a great tool to help close a deal uh, when there is a gap. Do I believe in incentives for the sake of incentives? Absolutely not. I think the best incentive that is available and in your toolbox is creating a process that businesses feel that they can get through and that's identifiable, that is consistent. There's nothing worse than having a goal line moved when you're trying to make the touchdown happen. Time is money for businesses. We have to assure that we are doing everything in our power to get them in the door and to open in a quick and efficient manner. How will you measure success? What are, what's mm -hmm. the matrix you would look at? 
I love that question as well. Um, how do I measure success? I, I think there's a number of ways. So if you look at economic development and best practices in economic development, there's a number of tools that they look at um, from job creation, tax base. You always want to be moving the tax base to shift to commercial, where the majority of your tax base is being paid by commercial versus residential. Um, vacancies are another great tool to identify. Um, capital investment, both from the public sector as well as the private sector. More importantly, I want to work with the council to identify metrics that you feel are valuable and important. So as we develop this first year work plan, again, holding back the strategic plan to look more visionary toward the end of the first year, but working with you to identify what are the metrics you want to hold us accountable for? And developing that partnership to get them accomplished. I, in looking at your impressive res resume, um, been a lot of different places. What is the largest budget you've managed? What, what size was that? So and where was it? Yes, thank you. Um, so the budgets that I've managed, uh, really, if you look at the Department of Economic Development as it's proposed in the mayor's budget, it's really sort of threefold. Um, the RDA budget, Economic Development, and Arts Council. When you look at Economic Development, Economic development, the budgets have been very similar. Um, I've always worked with lean, mean organizations. In terms of the RDA, um, this one is clearly a little bit bigger. The largest one I've run was about 12 million, um, but the skill set is the same. And I'm looking forward to utilizing this wonderful and talented staff that you have uh, to be able to continue to move the work forward. So the largest budget was 12 million? 12 million. They, they've done so it was 42 million feel a little overwhelming? Not at all. Not at all. I, again, I think the skills are the same. Um, whether it's 12 million or 42, the work is pretty much identical. There are those who believe that planning, zoning, and permitting should be the purview of the economic development director. Mm -hmm. And as the mayor is structuring it, that is coming under community and neighborhood development. Um, what are the positives to that structure instead of mm -hmm. having it be housed in your little house? Just announcing arriving. Sorry. Understood. <laughs> um, that's a great question. So uh, I want to repeat the question back to make sure I yeah, can sure. capture it properly. So uh, is it important to have permitting and planning as part of economic development? That tr in, in many feel like that should be the purview of an economic development director, and the shift we're making has it in community and neighborhood development. Mm -hmm. So I'm not. I, I'm asking what are the positives of not having it be in your wheelhouse sure. and having it housed elsewhere? So I think the, the positives of not having it as part of the Department of Economic Development are really twofold. One, planning takes a lot of time and energy, and it's time and energy that we can be out spending doing business recruitment, retention, expansion. Um, but we're going to be doing a little planning within the RDA, so it's not fully out of our, our purview. Um, two, I think there needs to be a healthy tension between permitting and economic development. Um, you know, we should be questioning timelines. We should be questioning process. Uh, and that's difficult to do when it's under the same roof. If it's your, your job. Yeah. It's kind of the fox guarding the hen house, I guess. Exactly. Um, in communities where you previously worked, was there an economic development association or were you the economic development association? So throughout my career, I really have been the economic development entity, um, be it in a department or as a public-private economic development corporation. That being said, there has been county economic development organizations, statewide economic development organizations, um, and then all the key stakeholders and partners in economic development. And within, throughout my career, I've had the pleasure of being able to build those partnerships and those relationships, and I'm looking forward to doing that also here in Salt Lake City. And I know that you um, are aware that we have an Economic Development Corporation of Utah. Yes. We work with them. What do you see the role of government being in working with a corporation like that? Sure. Uh, so the good news about the Economic um, ADC of Utah is that they have tools in their toolbox that we may not necessarily have. Um, they have some very extensive data research tools that they can tap into. They do national trade shows and international missions. 
again, we don't need to go on all those, but what we do need to do is develop a partnership and a relationship. Um, I think I used the word squeaking wheel uh, earlier today, but we need to be present and in front of them and having uh, ongoing conversations, sharing contacts and prospects. Again, we don't want to act in a vacuum. We want to have that relationship with both the EDC of Utah, the county economic development, and other stakeholders in the community. I know sometimes we feel a little bit like uh, we get overlooked, even though we're the capital city mm -hmm. um, by economic development of Utah, and um, that we, we want them to pitch some to us now yeah. and then. And yeah. how do you see your role in helping guide that? Do you, do you see us doing something independently, or do you see us trying to s steer some of the things that EDCU brings in? I think it's both. I don't think that we can rest upon others to do the work for us. I think we need to be out recruiting, retaining, expanding, and making investments in our community. Again, our reach and our budget being somewhat limited, um, we're not going to be able to go and do some of these international. But what we want to do is make sure that the EDC of Utah is armed with data and information and is prepared to have conversations about the city. And again, when I talk about the squeaking wheel, I would love to be able to sit in on their prospect meetings and have a conversation and pitch why Salt Lake should be in the contention for that opportunity. So we'll get there. It may not be today. But <laughs> what do you think is the most important thing that a local government can do to attract business? If you were just to pick one thing. One thing. I, I think it goes back to what we were talking about earlier, which is creating that consistent, identifiable process. Um, again, time is money. Businesses want to know how long it's going to take them to get open. They want to know that the city is working in partnership with them and is not um, working against them. There's always sort of this, you know, them versus us. Um, and our department can be that sort of, um, I like to use the word Sherpa. You know, we would love to help a business get up the mountain of the permitting process in a quick and efficient way without impeding upon life safety issues and you know there is a process that needs to be adhered to but sometimes understanding the process is the first step so I think I heard you say earlier that you thought that uh, you could do that even better by not having permitting under your responsibility do you think that's <laughs> that's the case I mean that you can further that even if it, you're not in charge of it I absolutely think that there is a benefit to healthy tension between permitting and economic development what, if any, are the parts of Enterprise Salt Lake City that you would like to see implemented? I know you're familiar with it. We had a great visit about it earlier. Yes, absolutely. So there, I think there were a couple of initial things. Um, the first was, I clearly I'm a little biased about this one, um, the fact that we're going to elevate economic development to a department level. I think it's an important move, and I think um, it allows for me to be able to work across the departments. So I think that that was a great recommendation, and I'm excited that the city is moving forward with that. Um, the second was the neighborhood uh, promotion of neighborhood level businesses. We talked about that a little bit early on in this conversation and the importance of promoting not just you know, for large corporate recruitment, but also the neighborhood commercial districts because it does make up the fabric of our neighborhoods. What, what are the top three reasons that you sought this job in Salt Lake City? I'm so glad you asked me that question. So the, the top three reasons um, my husband and I were appealing, appealed to this opportunity. The first was I was looking for an opportunity to work for another global world-class world city. If you look at my resume, Annapolis, Maryland. Everyone sort of knows it and has an image of Annapolis. Uh, Washington, D.C. Again, everyone pretty much knows Washington. Salt Lake City is a globally branded city. Um, so that was very appealing to me. The second thing that was really appealing to me was that this was an opportunity to utilize my skills. So when I look at what the key industries are in Salt Lake, they're industries that I've worked in, from manufacturing and logistics, entrepreneurship, life science and medical. Those are industries that I've worked in throughout my career, and I'm looking forward to being able to take those skills that I've learned through those opportunities and bring them here to Salt Lake City. And finally, what is the number one experience from your past that has prepared you for success as the Economic Development Director for Salt Lake mm -hmm. City? So I think the number one thing that has 
positioned me for success here in Salt Lake City is the fact that I'm very visionary. I can quickly come into a community, assess what needs to be accomplished, develop a work plan, um, develop strategic plans, and get to work. So. Thank you. I don't have any more questions, Mr. Chair. I know you're surprised. I usually have well, 12 pages, but I only have two. You don't need two. to even worry about it, because if you have more questions, we'll come back to you. Okay. <laughs> Laura, thank you very much. Thank you. We'll just go this way. How about that? Hello again. Thanks for being here. And I wanted to thank uh, Mayor Piskupski for finding such a well-qualified candidate. I think you bring a lot to the table. You and I have had the opportunity to speak uh, twice now, yesterday and today, and, and I feel really good about what we were able to discuss. Um, and I do have a couple questions that I'd like to repeat for um, the sake of you know having the public here. Um, Lisa did cover quite a few of them already, but um, I'll piggyback on what she's already brought up. Perfect. Um, we talked about the new Department of Economic Development and elevating that to a cabinet level position and you know that was obviously laid out in Enterprise SLC. Um, it's a great recommendation there. Um, you know looking at the departments that we are combining, Redevelopment Agency, the current Economic Development Department and the Arts Council, the lion's share is made up of the RDA. Um, but looking at what the resources are for economic development, they're pretty slim. So, you know, without having planning and building services and uh, transportation, uh, how do you imagine yourself um, leading the economic, develop de economic development department and interacting with these other critical divisions in our city that really play a large role in economic development? Um, so I thought I heard two questions, so I just want to make sure that I I'm capturing them okay. So one is how are we going to work um, for economic development to be multidisciplinary across departments. Indeed. And then two is the budget and the fact that the within the economic development division, the budget's rather limited. Okay. okay, so let me start with the budget question, if that's okay. Sure. Um, so one of the things that I'm a big believer in is creating work plans. Within those work plans, we're going to identify goals, objectives, tactics, who's responsible for them, and how much resources are going to take. We have to be very mindful that we don't have to do it all internally. Again, we can develop those partnerships to be able to allow for maximizing those, re those resources. Um, one of the things that I'd like to do is one of the positions within the Economic Development Division, I really want to create a research and marketing p component. A and the reason why is I want to make sure that if we're going to spend resources, that we're not using a spaghetti approach, that we're not going to throw it against the wall and see what sticks, but that we're going to be very thoughtful and we're going to use data and we're going to use metrics to assure that the resources we're spending are going to accomplish great things. So that was question one. Thank you. You're welcome. Question two, how do I see us working across the departments? And I've had the pleasure of the mayor was kind enough to call a cabinet meeting yesterday so I can meet a number of the, the cabinet level p directors. And I will tell you that they are so excited about economic development and so passionate. They've attended meetings with me. They've invited me to see their facilities. Um, I don't think it's going to be a problem of engaging them as part of our economic development plan. Um, and I'm looking forward to working with each of them. Great. Thank you. Um, so you talked already a bit about how you know you intend to work with GoEd and EDC Utah. So how do you see the new Economic Development Department interacting with um, other organizations like Local First Utah? And how do you see us, in addition to um, recruiting and um, expanding business in, in Salt Lake, how do you see us incubating local businesses? That's a great question. Um, so how do I see us incubating local businesses? Again, I think it's really important to understand that there are a, a wide array of tools out there, from the Small Business Development Center to the new Entrepreneurship Center being built at the U, um, to the Community College, which provides education and training on developing work plans. What I view our role is maybe not necessarily writing somebody's business plan, rather pointing them to the, the tools that are available and being that information clearinghouse. So, I also view us as being very uh, proactive, being on the ground. If somebody's even thinking about starting a business, we want to know about it. We want them to know how to reach out to our office to get pointed in the right direction to become successful. Great. Just two more questions. Uh, 
What role do you see as housing and housing choices for all people? What role does that play in our economic growth long term? That's a great question. Um, housing choices are, are critical. Again, if we're going to go out and recruit, retain, and expand businesses, um, not every business is an executive level business. And so we need to make sure that there's housing available for everyone. Um, we also have to look at data. And if you look at data, the city's demographic is interesting in that it's a lot of millennials. Millennials today don't want homes. They don't want stuff. They want apartments. They want the flexibility to travel. Uh, they want transit and transportation. So we need to make sure that we're providing housing that meets everybody's needs, wants, and desires. Great. Uh, just so you know, uh, housing is um, one of the main priorities. Affordable housing is one of the priorities of the council, and uh, I believe the mayor's administration as well. So that will be a topic for future conversation as well. Um, and finally, how do you plan to promote Salt Lake City to the rest of the world? You know, my understanding is that there is a perception problem to the rest of the country and you know globally for what Salt Lake City is. Um, and I see this as some heavy lifting to rebrand ourselves um, and start to recruit uh, new people and so new talent and new businesses to locate in Salt Lake. So how do you intend to promote Salt Lake and, and brand us? There's several ways I intend to brand Salt Lake. So the first is, again, you may have picked up a little bit that I'm a little strategic in my way of thinking. Um, and so one of the things that I really would love us to do is to create a strategic marketing plan. Within that strategic marketing plan, we're going to come up with key messages. Um, what are the proof points? How do we know we're getting a good return on the investment? What are the tactics we're going to take to be able to push that messaging out? So that's the first step. The second step is we're going to get out and talk to businesses. Our best sales force, beyond me and the wonderful team that's sitting behind me, are the businesses that live and work here. And so we want to make sure that they're engaged um, as part of this process. One of the best recruitment tools I've ever used is talking to a business owner about who didn't need it to be around them. You know, what types of businesses would make them successful? He's like, nobody's ever asked me that question before, but here are five people that you should call. <laughs> Fabulous. Those are the kind of conversations I want to be having with our local business community. Uh, just one more question. How do you intend to get out in the business community and really get close to the ground and hear the concerns and, and engage with the business owners? Do you have any uh, you know, practical tools or ideas on how you might go about that? Ooh, now we're getting pretty tactical. So, And having been here three days, I'm going to give you my initial blush. And sure. By no means is this going to be all of what I think the tactics are going to be. So the first one, I think, is there are a number of organizations that exist today, and being able to speak at their events I think is going to be important once we've identified this work plan. You know, what are our goals, objectives? We want to go out and share that information. Um, two, I think that, again, our website for economic development needs a little love. Um, we need to spend a little more time making sure that there's good information. Your website today is your front door. And so we want to make sure that our front door is open, that people can quickly get information. And two, thank goodness for social media. What a great, amazing tool to be able to promote and talk about all the wonderful things that are happening in economic development in Salt Lake City. Thank you very much, Laura. Thank you. Thanks for being here, Laura. It was, uh, I really enjoyed uh, sitting down with you this morning uh, and talking over uh, some things, some of the ideas that I've had. And um, since you've answered a lot of questions, um, I, wanted, I want to make more of a comment. Um, so having this um, department change is something that I think is long overdue. Um, I think that we need to have, we've, we've needed for a long time to have economic development as a department level uh, standalone position. Um, and so, I was really, really excited when, um, when the mayor started moving in that direction. When, the re when your recommendation came out, um, I, you know, I read it over, was very interested, had a lot of um, uh, excitement about you know, all of your experience on paper, things looked really good. Um, I, had, I had one reservation, and the reservation was that Salt Lake City 
uh, and Utah has a very unique culture. And I'm not talking religious culture. I'm just saying, you know, that overall it's a it's a very different place in terms of doing business. It's very tight knit, um, very uh, intimate in a lot of ways, and, and and it's different from from a lot of other places. So, in my mind, when I had talked about create you know creating a standalone position. Um, I always envisioned that we would have somebody started up who was local, who had a lot of experience working with existing businesses in the city, working with within uh, the unique culture that we have politically. Um, that was the one reservation I had. This morning when we met, um, you were able to clear all of those reservations. Um, I think that it, you definitely, from my perspective, have the uh, interpersonal skills, the ability, the vision that I think people within the community, business leaders, um, other cultural leaders, uh, really have been longing for in a Salt Lake City economic uh, development focus for a long time. Um, so I just want to, and I've heard that, that I've heard that concern from others that you know maybe we had it, we should have gone with somebody local first. Um, you know, I just wanted to be fully uh, open and say I agreed with that, but uh, you you won me over. Um, I think your vision for uh, the department, the uh, detail to which you were able to answer my questions, um, I was very impressed, and I, I hope things go well uh, tonight with the vote, and I, I look forward to working closely with you. Thank you. Thank you, Charlie. Stan, I was going to say leadership last. Stan, do you have any <laughs> questions? <laughs> I don't really have any questions. I appreciate your time. Uh, thank you, Mayor, for your effort and diligence on this. Thank you, um, Ms. Fritz, about your honesty and openness in meeting with us. I appreciate that very much. Uh, I, I like the concept that you've been able to uh, to answer Charlie's fears, um, answer all of um, Lisa's questions which is a daunting task at times. Um, I also appreciate you coming from a different perspective. Uh, I, I think that uh, as much as we do have an interesting dynamic here, Charlie, you're correct in a lot of ways, uh, we also have a very unique place on the um, sort of spear, uh, spear point of the state in a lot uh, that requires us to look out external a lot more than perhaps other places might. Uh, and I think that's an important thing to remember as you come in and as we talk to you about this, that we're not talking about the county necessarily or the state we're talking about, and like you said, an international uh, presence uh, to some extent. So I appreciate that, that viewpoint, and I look forward to working with you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Laura. I would think I was the last one to meet with you, so um, thank you. We, I won't rehash anything that we went through, but I do have some questions. Okay. and. And kind of kicking off of what Charlie was saying about our unique community here, there's a few things I've noticed about Salt Lake City that you might notice too. Um, we're very huggy. <laughs> people hug all the time. Business people, uh, city people with business people. It's a, it's a, I think it's a strange thing, but we, it's a very huggy environment around here. Um, there's great opportunity for collaboration with the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. They're definitely a big entity in the city. There are definitely political differences between um, most of the people uh, who are representatives in City Hall and the church itself, and yet there is a really warm and welcoming landscape that I think you'll find for connection with them, partnership with them, and I hope that that will be one of the first uh, calls that you make and meetings that you set up. Um, and also, as far as this body goes, I've said it before, I think we're seven open doors. Can I say that for all of you? Uh, that I can't speak for the council, but we uh, are open and excited to building a relationship with you and learning how we can complement ec economic development, where those priorities are and what we should move quickly on when needs be. Um, I appreciated your sentiment about that uh, 
there are times when uh, filling that gap is necessary and I hope that you, I trust that your ex expertise will bring those opportunities to us. Not every single opportunity is uh, necessarily the right fit for Salt Lake City. And we talked a bit about the uniqueness of our city and that's something this council and RDA board have talked a lot about in the last year, in the last six months our uniqueness as a city, that we aren't the same um, in many different ways from tax increment fi financing or the lack of it in certain areas uh, to the culture of our city and that we're different from Lehigh, uh, from Ogden, from West Valley and we want to be that and we want to be as the capital city. So a few questions for you um, that I'd throw at you in your, in your nearly first day here. Um, we have the University of Utah, as you know, here in our city. We're so grateful for them as an anchor, as a cultural entity, um, and for all of the, the great minds that come out of there and the potential certainly is there for economic development. Can you talk to us about an experience you've had in your past um, of bringing on board uh, existing anchor tenants into a more strategic and involved role in the city? I think that there's opportunity for that here and I'd like to know if you have experience in that in the past. I'm gonna ask to clarify the question. So, cause I've, I think I may have heard two questions. One is uh, the relationship with the University of Utah and the second is how do we recruit anchor tenants, large tenants the to the city. With the city? To work with the city. We can get to the other anchor tenants in a second, okay. but mostly about how, what kind of experience have you had in the past of strengthening relationships with existing anchor tenants mm -hmm. to become more collaborative in uh, initiatives at the city end? Absolutely. Um, so through all my career, I've felt that it's very important to have a strong retention program. Um, and with that strong retention program, uh, we're meeting with all businesses of all sides, um, from you know, the neighborhood commercial district to the large anchor tenants. Um, and what I found is that the anchor tenants generally don't need a whole lot of resources. Um, they generally have someone who's helping them through a permitting process. Um, they already understand how to get resources, but where they really do need assistance is in supply chain. Um, and again, having those businesses that surround them to continue to allow them to be successful. So the conversations that I think we need to have with those larger employers is what is it that they need? What are the types of businesses well, that we can bring in to help surround them or that we can foster from within? You know, perhaps there's a business that's already doing it and they're just not aware. So those are the kind of conversations I think we can have in terms of those larger employers. I like that angle. It's not what I was thinking, uh, but just to clarify, I'm sorry I wasn't very clear. Um, for example, with transportation and the possibility of um, streetcar connections going to the University of Utah and those kind of investments that the city um, sh could look at making and should look at making in partnership with those that size of an entity. Um, they are well established. They're, it's a very healthy state funded university and um, they don't really need us for zoning as the as their estate entity. Um, but I'm, I guess I'm looking for as you, and you don't need to respond to this, but as you go into this job, um, strengthening that relationship of collaboration with them. And certainly it's great to strengthen it in terms of them utilizing businesses in the city and helping foster new businesses, but also for those partnership opportunities as we make investments in the city that benefit the university and vice versa. Um, can you, uh, the university is one of these, but can you give us a taste of what enticed you in terms of what unique economic features Salt Lake City has that you are looking forward to branding and exploiting to bring more business into our city? Absolutely. Um, we talked a little bit already about the industries that are um, sort of the major employers in Salt Lake City. So I think that those are um, industries that I've worked in and feel comfortable and have some knowledge of um, and I'm looking forward to building off of existing strengths. Two, it's a beautiful community. Um, you have a 360 degree view of the mountains um, and I think building off of the beauty that is here. Um, and then last but not least, I think it's going to be important to continue to foster entrepreneurship. There's going to be times where businesses are going to close. But what we want to know is that we have a pipeline of new potential opportunities 
ready to fill those storefronts, be able to grow, be able to expand. And so economic development is always going to be occurring. Um, who is your first meeting going to be with outside of City Hall on your first day here at work? I, I believe it will be the LDS Church. Oh, I pitched that one to <laughs> you. Did, you did. You teed okay, it up for me. Okay, who's your second meeting going to be with? That was a good answer, though. <laughs> um, well, I've been very fortunate that I've met with a number of stakeholders in the community over the last couple of days. And with that, um, I'm hoping to meet with the university. In fact, I think that Simone was kind enough to get that set up for Wednesday. So that will be one of the conversations I'll be having as well. Uh, and then I think it's going to be important to have a dialogue with state representatives and their staff and understanding what their economic development priorities are for Salt Lake City. I know that we've talked a little um, in prior questions about EDC Utah and the opportunity there. But um, recently, I, I mentioned this to you, we requested some information from EDC Utah about their recruitment efforts and how we've benefited. And there's a list and they're always, uh, every year we get a little list of, of businesses that they've helped recruit here. My hope for you is that you will be able to bring to us a list of everything, everybody who you snagged that was going to be on Lehigh's list or West Valley's <laughs> list or Ogden's list. And I'm totally serious about this. There are businesses that come here and they maybe want to look in Salt Lake City because the airplane lands here and it's the capital city and we have unique amenities, but maybe they don't find the parcel. And EDC Utah's representation is broad. There's dozens of municipalities that they represent. Um, and therefore, they are able and willing to drive them out of our city limits into another city. That's where I want you and your team to be, to be intersecting. I would love it if uh, we had an opportunity to specify in our dollars that we allocate to that contract that you have that opportunity to do those ride-alongs when they're showing parcels in our city or that you get a call when they're not finding what they need or there's some barriers that EDC Utah can't help them overcome. So. Whether or not you actually bring us that list, I hope that that'll be one of your goals. Um, we, we think about this in terms of the convention and that we know that there are large scale conventions that pass us by that were interested in us if we had a convention hotel large enough to accommodate them. Um, the creation of an economic development department can be our convention hotel of sorts. There are businesses we're missing and that we can recruit because you're here and because of the work you're gonna do. Um, so let us know, too, when you get into that role and that relationship, how we can help foster uh, those end goals that I hope we'll share. And then my last piece is just about that visioning and the work plan that I know you're going to be starting to create from day one and, and that we'll get to see the fruits of in months' time. Um, but my hopes for this, and, and I'll probably send you an email because you shouldn't take notes right now, but I hope that it'll fall uh, in front of your eyes again, is that, that we have some goals for net new jobs in this city. We know we have a doubling population in the region over the coming short years. Um, and we have a fairly small and stable population as a capital city. We want to grow. Housing is a piece of that. Jobs is a piece of that. And as we grow in a centric way to further densify our awesome old neighborhoods that we have, um, we want a workforce that can hop on the train, hop on the bus, get on a bike, drive if they need to, but be to work in a short amount of time. So net new jobs. I want us to focus on raising our per capita income. Um, this is a natural, I think, uh, secondary effect of, of increasing our economy here and making housing more affordable, but I think that it'd be fantastic to set some goals and include that in our vision. Um, I'd like to know how many uh, capital investments, how in terms of millions or billions of dollars that you could see us creating and drawing into the city in the next 10 years or whatever timeline you want to establish. Um, but I'd like to have some numbers around that. How many anchor tenants? How many global partners are we looking to bring in? We have um, the fair trade opportunity within our city limits, and that's another point that we can uh, do a lot more with than we're doing currently. So I'd like to see some goals around that, and um, spe specifically around increasing global trade and investment within our city limits. We have tools that other cities don't have, and, and we can do more with that. So. Uh, I'll send those to you, and I look forward to your strategic marketing plan as well. 
um, in whatever way we can help and complement and support you with that, please let us know. We're seven open doors. Thanks, Laura. Thank you. So sorry, Stan, you're not next. Lisa has some follow-up questions. Still in your thunder again, Stan. I, um, as chair of the RDA, I, this morning when we met, you were able to talk a little bit about your experience with working with tax increment. Yes. Do you want to, I, I don't know if the rest of the council has had that opportunity to know your expertise there, but I'd like you to have a chance to lay that out. Oh, thank you. Um, so throughout my career, I've been able to work in tax increment financing um, and special assessment districts. So my very first job, I created uh, bid number six for the city of Milwaukee. Uh, wrote the, the bid plan um, and was able to get it through the council to fund infrastructure improvements in a, a blighted commercial district in Milwaukee. Um, in uh, Rockville, I was involved in a $623 million project that was a very difficult capital stack that included tax increment financing, parking districts, um, which are very similar to tax increment financing, only the revenue off the parking garages go back in for maintenance and repair. Um, so we were able to create uh, parking districts. In Cudahy, Wisconsin, I managed a $12 million bid. I also worked with the state legislature to create enabling legislation that allowed for sharing of revenue between environmental tax increment districts. So in Wisconsin, environmental tax increment financing districts, very similar to TIF districts, only the revenues can only be used for remediation. The city of Cudahy had a very successful TIF district. It was throwing off about an additional $6 million of revenue. Uh, the city was hesitant to close it out, but felt that those funds could be used to offset um, the remediation of a solid waste slash trash dump um, that the city of Milwaukee had owned and a private developer had purchased. Um, however, we had to create legislation that allowed for that to occur. Um, and then in Southeast Fairfax, we very lightly used tax increment financing for a project. Um, Fairfax County really isn't a believer in providing incentives, and that's just a philosophy that they use. Um, but throughout my career, it's been a big part of the conversation. And most importantly, over the last two years, I've worked for the eighth largest accounting firm in the world, teaching companies how to utilize um, various incentives, both statutory, negotiated, and various loan programs that are available at the federal and county and state levels. Um, and with the goal of minimizing the equity that a developer has to put into a project. So that makes me a little dangerous on the other side of the table now um, because I know what developers are looking to accomplish. So uh, you would say that you, you know both sides of that coin really I well, I would say. Um, previous council really got burned on an economic development director who was hired, who was from out of state. Um, and there are those who think that if you didn't, I told you this earlier, if you weren't born at Holy Cross Hospital and didn't attend East Highland Wester Judge, you probably won't work out here. Can, can you give us some reassurance that you will be here more than short term if you have your way? Absolutely. My resume speaks for itself. Um, I've been an at-will employee on a number of occasions. That being said, my husband and I are moving across the country for this opportunity. We are committed to Salt Lake City, and most importantly, we're looking forward to getting involved. I, I think I shared with a number of you that I've been very involved with Junior Achievement since high school, and I'm looking forward to continuing my relationship with the Junior Achievement of Utah. Thanks so much. And finally, I understand you are looking for a home, and that would be located in? The city of Salt Lake, <laughs> in one of your fabulous districts. <laughs> District 7 has a lot to offer, just, just saying. Okay. Yes, Thank you so much. Quickly. Thank you, Mr. Chair, for indulging me, and Vice Chair Pemfold. Thanks. All right, Stan. Laura, well, thank you so much for being here today and uh, taking your time. Um, I just have one question, and I'd like you to talk a little bit about your experience as it relates to the tension that can develop between economic development, which is frequently considered sort of a pro-business um, division and um, neighborhoods. We have really strong neighborhoods in the city and there is very often some tension around uh, what's for the neighborhood and what's for business. Have you had some experience in managing that? Absolutely. Um, 
Sure, right. There is sort of a, a natural tension that any time there's development that occurs, um, there's concerns that come up from the community. And you know, one of the things that I've prided myself on throughout my career is to be able to be that facilitator and to bring together those divergent opinions and try to get to consensus. Don't get me wrong, I'm absolutely happy to make decisions, but as much as possible we want to find where the happy medium is. And the only way to do that is by being out, being public, having conversations with the residents' associations, having conversations with the developers, and again, trying to find that middle ground. There's always a middle ground. Um, so we just need to figure out where it is. One of the uh, advantages of the structure that's been created for this position is the highlight for economic development, which I think has been needed for a long time in the city. But it also uh, creates uh, two separate departments, one for economic development, one for neighborhoods. How, how do you see that working relationship? Absolutely. I think it's a critical relationship. Um, one, Mike and his team are going to be developing the vision for the community. Our go but nothing gets built without economic development. Nothing gets built without a tenant. So it's going to be really important for economic development to be out there pipelining great businesses that want to do business here and then helping them identify neighborhoods and business communities and places where their business makes the most sense to locate. Thank you. Thank you. Have you ever worked at a municipality that has this type of setup? Every position I've been in has had economic development as a separate entity. Um, either it's been privatized or it's been its own separate department. But throughout my career, it, we've had a very close-knit relationship. Um, and some of the best projects that have come out have been because of those partnerships. Um, and Lisa asked my question, you know, my question is going back through your resume, I was wondering, you know, it looked like the longest that you'd stayed in an area was four and a half years and wanted to hear the reasoning behind that. Sure. And that goes back to being an at-will employee. Mm -hmm. um, there were a couple of times where I chose to leave a position and in that case one was my father wasn't well and I chose to return to Wisconsin to help my mother care for him. Um, the other was I really miss economic development, but sometimes you just need to take a break. And so while I've been fortunate to have an amazing experience where I am today, um, it was a nice break, and now I'm ready to hit the ground running and do great work for the city of Salt Lake City. Well, you and I discussed this earlier that um, Lisa's right. You know, uh, there are so many long generational families here that uh, have a large stake in, in the city as well as people that want to move here. They have a stake in the city as well. I think that it complements itself very well. We're, we're, we're a very welcoming, open society that, that we want everybody to come to Salt Lake City. And I think that these other municipalities poach off of us. So I love what Aaron's take was on that. You know, focus on, on Salt Lake City, but more specifically District 1 and 2, uh, <laughs> the, which is the west side of Salt Lake City because it, in actuality it has the most potential currently with, with uh, master plans that are going on and moving forward. Um, so here's a question. I'm glad the mayor's at the table so it doesn't look like I'm pinning you two against each other. What happens with your vision when it doesn't align with her vision? Sure. The mayor and I are going to spend some time together having a conversation about her vision. Um, and we're going to make sure that that envision is, and with the council too, uh, that your visions are incorporated into that first year work plan. Okay, that's great. And of, like we discussed earlier today in our interview, is just having key indicators of success. How do you, how are you going to define that? I mean, with, through nonprofits and through, you know, uh, people that are entrepreneurs as well as large businesses, how are you going to come up with an actual indicator saying, yes, this is how we're measuring success. Sure. Again, we're going to look at best practices, so things like vacancy rates, business starts, capital investment, um, job growth, that those standard metrics. That being said, I also want to work with the council because those are very uh, data-driven metrics. And my guess is that there's going to be some qualitative metrics that you're going to want us to track as well. Um, one of the things that I think is going to be valuable is we want to create a customer relationship management tool for the department that allows us to track information and data. So when a business comes in, we understand where did they come, how did they come to us? Was it a trade show? Was it a marketing piece that we did? Um, and then what happened with them? Did they start a business? Did they go to another community? And why? Um, so those are the, the data sets that we were going to be collecting. 
And again, we're going to work with you to make sure that we're collecting the information you want to see. Uh, something that's really important to me, and as well as the rest of the council, we've talked about it at length, is the opportunity index. I'm sure that you haven't seen that yet. It's mm -hmm. something I think it was the U view or the county did. I don't remember which. The U of U did it, and it's a, it shows the opportunity where in the city you have the most opportunity. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's, it, there's a big disparity between the east and west side. And for me, mm -hmm. it's finding out opportunities through housing, through business, you know, opportunities, creating opportunities for people who are, might be underprivileged, underprivileged to create those opportunities so that they have high-paying jobs, success to go to school, uh, to the university to get a degree. I just think... The more that we can focus on opportunities and creating opportunities across the board, the better the city plays out. Agreed. So I, we can get that to you for sure, but I'm, I can guarantee that Peter or someone in the department there will get it for you with your, either RDA or, or even Mike Ackerlo from hand. So I'm I just sure. really appreciate you being here. I, for me, Salt Lake City has always been a blank canvas uh, that you can come in and people will be open and willing to work with you and, and just welcome to Salt Lake City. And, We'll see tonight at 7 o'clock, right? Seven <laughs> I tell everybody when they come in for board appointments, you don't have to stay because it's on the consent agenda, but you might want to stay. You need to stay, actually. <laughs> I'll make I it clear be. about that. And also, just uh, you've heard several um, council members promoting their own district, so let me just be clear that the best city council district is the district you're in at the moment. So whatever that is when you're in the city, keep that in mind. That's right. Thank you very much. And thank, thank you, Mayor, for being at the Thank table. you. Uh, we're going to move on to item number three. It's not your budget, I understand that, but we're going to be discussing it now. I absolutely. <laughs> is the proposed economic development, uh, new proposed department, as well as the budget. So I understand Patrick Leary, as well as, uh, who's the chief of staff for the mayor, as well as our policy analyst, Allison Rowland, are there at the table. All right, Allison, is it, are we going to listen to Patrick or you first? Pretty much everything I have to say is in the staff report, Great. Um, which I'm sure you've all read thoroughly. Um, so, so I believe the questions that may be useful to focus on are related to the economic development loan fund position, the possibly the RDA. I'm not clear on, on where those discussions will take place. Uh, questions regarding the Arts Council funding for the Twilight Concert and uh, the media report and potential metrics that you'd be interested in. All right, Council Members, are there any questions uh, in regards to this budget for Patrick? The uh, Department? Yeah, Patrick, would you mind discussing the, the proposed um, Department and how sure. that's, that's going to work through? I'd be glad to. Thank you for the opportunity. <clears throat> As you know, this department has been contemplated for some time, and the dialogue around creating a economic development department is something that I think has uh, percolated through the city for many, many years and many iterations. And so when we uh, came into office, we took that information very seriously. In past information, past studies, the Enterprise SLC study that was done last year, and we propose before you the Department of Economic Development. <clears throat> it is with a great deal of uh, intention that we chose to construct it or, or uh, engineer it or whatever the term might be to, for the proposal that's before you today, uh, bringing the economic arm of the city into a cabinet-level position folding in the redevelopment agency into that so that so that we're having one team of people moving in the same direction. And of course, uh, the mayor feels very, very strongly, and I think you, many of you on the council may uh, feel strongly as well, that arts and culture are uh, as part of an economic uh, driver for us and therefore moving the arts council and that team of people into this department. Um, what arts and culture do for the quality of life we have is simply helps drive that economic engine. So with that, that's the proposal before you. And uh, if you do have questions, I'm glad to answer them. Stan. <clears throat> Patrick, I appreciate your comments about the Arts Council, and I do agree that um, 
it certainly provides, uh, in my mind, a, a significant incentive for recruitment and for people um, uh, relocating here when considering quality of life. One of my concerns about um, having uh, the Arts Council under economic development is that the 10 that we may have to start evaluating the arts on an economic uh, matrix. And um, can you, have you gotten into the specifics around that? Or, or perhaps I can just share my personal concern about a caution is that, you know, arts programming is subsidized programming. And, and, and I, I'm concerned that we um, have a conversation that suggests otherwise. So I, I personally want to uh, make a commitment to the arts that's above and beyond some matrix that might evaluation is return on dollar because I, I haven't seen that successful anywhere. And if you have a model, uh, I'd love to see it. No, I, Could I you think, address that? I do. I, I can. I think we uh, echo your concerns there. We're looking at this as a philosophical alignment, not necessarily a, a return on investment for the arts. That uh, the, these really, we understand that arts in, in many cases are going to be subsidized, but the integration and the importance they play to the overall big picture is of such import that we think that they need to be part of this department. Well, They're not measuring their funding uh, based upon a return on investment. I appreciate that. And, and I absolutely agree that it is, as a quality of life consideration, um, we undersell our Arts Council and, and what we have access to as residents of the city. So I appreciate the elevation of that cultural amenity um, to our residents and in the process of recruiting as well. Thank you. Eric. This is more of a statement than a question. Um, you know, looking at the economic development budget for 2016-2017 uh, and having the opportunity to speak to uh, Laura Fritz and the mayor about economic development being a priority, I, I just see this as a little bit under-resourced right now um, because if we're going to do a marketing campaign for Salt Lake, let's say, or if we're going to potentially need to look at new software, I just I want to be clear that we're mentioning this now that um, it's going to need more resources down the road and um, I hope we have the ability to do so with future budget openings, but I just see this as something that we need to be conscious of moving forward. Thank you. And let me address that as well. It was very important to this mayor that as we created or proposed the creation of new departments that we do so without adding extra cost to the taxpayers at this point in time. And equally important to the mayor that before we go down that path, and we would agree with you, I think we're under-resourced there, that we have a director in place who can put some thought and some analysis to that before, um, before we come back with, a, with some requests. Mr. Chairman, may I just follow up? Patrick, have you had a conversation about what that timeline line might look like? Do you expect to be back six months, next budget cycle? Have you, do you have a thought about that? Uh, you know, I'd actually look to her soon, hopefully, to be director. I think she, she's got a lot of work on her strategic plan, and I think it, I would imagine that it will be the next budget cycle. I don't okay. know that we'd want to, uh, unless there was some urgent um, something coming, uh, Let's get all those ducks in a row. Before well, now's the time to actually make commitments so that she's <laughs> obligated to if you want to do that. So, uh, <laughs> well, if you want to open the money back. She, she hasn't been appointed yet, Patrick. You can go ahead and come in. <laughs> okay, Char Charlie and then Aaron. Uh, yeah, just a, a quick follow-up on, on Derek's comment. Um, you know, I, too, think that this is um, a very conservative budget especially to kick off um, a new department. That said, I actually prefer that at this point because um, as a council member, one of the, I'm always worried about putting too much money into something that we don't know what we're actually getting yet. Um, and so one of the things that I'm, I'm really looking forward to is what um, Laura comes back with, what the plans are, and so that we can actually put specific funding towards a concrete plan as opposed to just having um, a big pool of money with, with a lot of wiggle room. So I, I actually I do think that we are going to have to fund this um, much more in the future. 
um, but I'm, I'm perfectly comfortable and actually prefer having uh, a conservative um, budget at this point uh, just so that uh, Laura can get into the job, figure out, you know, how things are, where things need to go, and then come to us with specific, specific funding requests. Did you have anything, Erin? Yeah, I, there was a, some talk about legislative intent that we request that we have a follow-up. And if we need to set it as um, by the next budget session uh, season or, or before, I, there's kind of the chicken or the egg. You want to have a lot, enough time to develop the plan, but you're probably going to need some money to do the plan. And so when you decide to do that, um, I would like the council to do some legislative intent requesting that it happen. And when it happens is uh, as long as it's before next budget, um, be even earlier than that would be okay. We want to hear back so that we can make sure that um, we're helping the ball roll along and that we're all able to see the, the data the that's going to come cycle. out of it. So if we're looking at tracking a legislative intent, are you thinking for the uh, for next week? Uh, for this well, budget? Today? Yes. Um, or, or if may I suggest then today. that that it seems like by the end of the year would be a good timeline because that would be a, at least a good check-in point before the end of the year and then an opportunity for input before going into a budget cycle. Which could okay. just pertain to how the first 90 days have been with the new uh, director. Okay. And to be clear, I don't think that we're suggesting that um, everything needs to be articulated at that point of check-in, but so that we can be caught up to speed at what's happened between June and January. Um, that and I, I, I totally understand where you're coming from. This is a priority for the council economic development. Big and priority. Even if they're baby steps, we want to hear about them. Well, we appreciate that, and we'll uh, we'll be glad to communicate as much and as often as necessary. But we know that at least there's a timeline. So great. And I think other than that, are there any other questions? Uh, it's been Andrew. Mr. Chair, uh, I have a question about where we're at with the discussions regarding advice and consent for the, the RDA uh, leadership position, I guess. I forget the name now. The exact, not the executive director, the director. The RDA director? Yeah. yeah. So that, that's, that's great. It was actually leading into what I was going to do, is mm -hmm. do a straw poll. I know that it's been on uh, a lot of council members' minds that to have to retain advice and consent for the RDA, for me, is, is very important for that director's position. So. Um, I would just look for a, a quick straw poll for council members. Uh, if you're in favor of retaining advice and consent and figuring out a way that we can do that uh, before the, the end of the budget for next week. For RDA director. For RDA director, retaining that. That's, for me, that's a, that's a huge deal. Um, so we would look for a straw poll for a thumbs up. Mr. Chair, would you, would you mind speaking to that? You know, why, why, where the importance lies for this kind of position in the city? Yeah. I for sure can do that. And anyone else who wants to jump in and, and feel like they would like to, to share it, it's great. Um, since 1979, since we have had the mayor council form of government, we have had advice and consent. We've held that, that power to, to appoint that position and approve that a position. Uh, for me, RDA is one of the top three budgets that we've got in the city. It's a, it's a huge budget. It's 40 plus million for the budget plus in assets, it's over $100 million that we're looking at that the RDA controls. And without us having advice and consent, I think that we would be shooting ourselves in the foot in the long run, not for us, but for future council, for councils as well. I think that, um, I mean, you look at where we were with public utilities and, and moving forward with the, with the new director's positions. If we did not have that, we would be in a different world today. Uh, advice and consent in the RDA is the exact same scenario. Mayor. So um, just so I'm clear on what you're pursuing. So Laura will be over the RDA. And this is the person you want advice and consent over, correct? No, we want advice and consent over the individual, the deputy director is how you've got it in your deputy uh, the director chief, role. The chief administrative? No. Uh, Which no, we haven't settled on title yet. yet. But I, whatever the title is that Justin currently holds, okay. that's what we would like to have advice and consent on. Okay. And, I, I don't and we do not have that at deputy director levels anywhere else. No. Okay. And I feel comfortable keeping the RDA at a, a cabinet level position. I really do. It's that important for us to have advice and consent. Please. 
I think uh, maybe just a little bit of clarification. The cabinet level concept is is 100%. We sometimes use that interchangeably with department director, but it, the cabinet really is 100% the mayor's discretion. And so the mayor could put, she may have some valuable people and some, some functions that are important to her that she would put in her cabinet that advises her. Uh, and she, um, so she, see, she's certainly free to do that. I think what council members have talked to me about is the possibility of retaining the RDA uh, position or, or putting the RDA position at a department level so that the council can retain advice and consent, but not uh, attempting to make a statement about it being separate from economic development, supporting still the formation of the economic development department and recognizing that the mayor may choose on a daily basis to have whatever type of reporting relationship she uh, chooses with, with her departments. She can have two departments re, uh, report to some person in her office. She can have one department report to another department. That's whoever is the mayor, it is their discretion to, uh, on a functional basis, uh, place their, their people, uh, how they would how they would like them on a day-to-day -day basis. So what I think council members have been asking me about is to retain advice and consent, since it's only at the department head level, can we make RDA a department? I think that, that that's just a little nuance. Much and better it's a explain. technicality. Right. Does that help explain, Mayor, where we're coming from? Yeah, so you're, rather than a division, is essentially what Lisa saying, or I'm sorry, Cindy. Cindy. Okay. The person who falls so, in the room. So yes, I think it would be good to have some additional conversations about this offline. But yeah, I get it. Okay. okay. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Patrick, for coming to the table. Of course, Allison. Sure. So a follow up question, real quick. Okay. So so currently, as it's um, as it's designed. The RDA director, whatever the position is going to be called, would be appointed by the um, director of economic development. Is that correct? Or would that be still be a mayor's level appointment continually? Well, the way it's, or yeah. an executive director uh, right. appointment. The way this is being described, it would give me the appointment with you doing advising consent. Okay, so it wouldn't be the economic director. Who's supervising that? It still be an uh, executive director appointment. It would still be a mayor appointment. Is that what? So we about? just we let's just make sure. Let's do a straw poll really quickly uh, for council members that you want to retain advice and consent for the position in the RDA, which is currently Justin's position. However, that's going to be labeled whatever there. the title is. Whatever the title may be. So thumbs up that you want to retain advice and consent, mm -hmm. and that is seven up. Okay. And a clarification, Mr. Chair, I think it's a technicality. I don't want to confuse people about this. It's still the mayor's discretion. I do think it's important that the mayor play a significant role in the selection of that position, and I would imagine that's her intent anyway. So, uh, uh, but it's a technicality about um, how we are involved, not about how the mayor manages her staff or her cabinet. And the mayor would still choose that position, absolutely. The council's only role would it be up or down vote. Okay. Great. Does that answer your question, Andrew? Thank you. We are going to move on to item number four, uh, the proposed sustainability and refuse budgets. We are still about 20 minutes behind, 25 minutes behind. No. Why would it? It was great. I'm sure Laura appreciated it too, right? It was great. Thank you. <laughs> uh, we have Vicki Bennett, who is the Sustainability Environment Division Director, as well as Lehua Weaver from uh, Council staff. Okay, Lehua, I'm just trying to pull mine up. Sure. And actually, Vicki's going to start with an introduction and go over some of the budget details, and then we're ready to respond to council questions. Great. Thank you. Good afternoon, council members, and I'm glad to be here with you. Um, 
it's uh, hard to believe that it's been 15 years since I was hired as the environmental manager for Salt Lake City. And when, we, when I first started, it was just a position of coordinating all of the EPA and environmental regulations. And during that time frame, sustainability was but a nascent field where a small group of staff members from cities across the country got together on the telephone regularly saying, what are you doing? What does this mean? What sort of programs can we create? How do we embed this new idea of sustainability into city operations? So eight years ago, we formed the Sustainability Division formally, and we're now one of about 200 sustainability programs across the country. And generally, the programs, as you look at all the various cities, are very much like ours, establishing programs and policies for both municipal operations and then for our citizens. So we have actually built a program that we're very proud of and is one of the most comprehensive in the nation. And we are considered a leader by our peers. Our progressive actions have provided numerous opportunities for grant funding and recognition. Some examples of, as of recent are including being on the White House Climate Task Force and being designated a climate action champion. We're one of 10 cities that were awarded a city energy project invitation only grant, which is financing our project skyline and elevate buildings programs to reduce energy use in commercial buildings. We've been awarded a series of grants from the DOE to improve solar opportunities in both municipal operations and for our businesses as residents. And we were once again, due to our recognition nationally, been invited to apply for and received what's called a Healthy Babies Bright Future grant to address toxic chemicals that infants and children may be exposed to. And we're now completing negotiations to receive recognition as an eco-America city, which also may bring us some grant or personnel funding into the city to help us be the second city in the nation to work on a large climate communication approach with our citizens. So we are at the forefront of the sustainability field. And I'd like to count, thank the council and the administration for all of the support that we've had now and over the past years to make this happen. So I'm excited that we now have the opportunity to make a further investment in our city's future by elevating the, city, the sustainability division to a department under our mayor. A key point often made in business is that initiatives can only succeed well with top management support. And by making sustainability a cabinet level department, this support will be integrated more into city operations and ensure that we put a sustainability filter on every decision we make from the city, like the type of buildings we're going to build, the vehicles we'll purchase, the ways we seek to build and grow our economy, and in other words, to make sustainability a part of our community culture and daily operations. Salt Lake City is taking a strong stance on air quality issues, working with community groups, state agencies, and nonprofit partners to tackle this difficult problem. It will be imperative for sustainability to have a direct connection to the mayor, representing her at intergovernmental meetings that will set policy and implement regional strategies. Directly connected to air quality are the city's climate planning efforts, as Salt Lake City has been taking the lead on climate issues in the region. There are new opportunities to take action and collaborate on climate and energy issues, and the sustainability department will represent these cities, the city in those networks. Within the community, sustainability staff partner with residents, neighborhoods, businesses, academia, and others to integrate sustainability goals and practices into their homes, businesses, and planning. These partnerships enhance the long-term economic, environmental, and social health of the entire region. Two areas of emphasis in sustainability, including sustainable economic development and social equity, will require working with many partners. By integrating sustainability into development decisions, we will make better choices about the long-term growth of the community. And we will also need to look at our decisions through an equity lens, ensuring that we work to improve air quality, energy efficiency efforts, and food security in our less advantaged communities. Uh, Mayor, I didn't know if you had anything you wanted to say before I move into budget. Some um, more budget issues? Here to support. Great, yeah. thank you. All right. So before I go into the details of this year's proposed budget, I'd like to take a minute to briefly review our department's structure, proposed structure, and then the three funding streams that I know sometimes can get a little bit confusing. 
So we are proposed to have two divisions, and they're the two programs that we've had in sustainability in the past. The first is our sanitation. Sometimes we call it operations division in the budget. And that's our weekly garbage recycling and yard waste pickup, neighborhood cleanup, can maintenance, business recycling efforts, and citizen education. This is the part of the fund that is financed by the monthly refuse fees paid for by the homeowners. This division is led by Lorna Vogt, who's been with the city for almost one year now. She came to us from the county and has already done a lot of analysis and implemented new programs and policies to make our sanitation program yet more efficient and to continue to respond to our citizens' needs in an effective manner. Then we have our sustainability program within the department, and that's our policy and programs, including environmental compliance, energy efficiency, renewable energy, air quality, food programs, communications, and outreach. This division also tracks citywide sustainability goals for our web dashboard. It is funded by the annual landfill dividend that we receive as a part owner of the landfill and recycling proceeds when we're available to get any of those. The division is led by Debbie Lyons, who's been with the city for 20 years and is an, an invaluable source of institutional knowledge for us. Then we also have our one-time landfill dividend money, which you often hear to referred to as the 5.5 million, just as a uh, shortcut. And this is excess funds that was received from the landfill. It was actually $7 million received in 2011. Now this was at that time divided 5.5 million into these special projects and 1.5 million was placed into the sanitation program because at the time we were confirmed concerned about our sanitation fund balance. However, that same year we brought our recycling program in-house, found even more efficiencies, and have not needed to use any of that money. So a few major items I'd like to point out in this year's budget. We've made an effort to ensure that it will be a minimal expense to transition from a division to a department. I've requested one additional FTE for administrative needs, such as payroll, contracting, and administrative assistance, such as responding to citizen inquiries. The cost for this position will be partially offset by not paying overhead to public services, as we did in the past. We will also be able to reduce some of our seasonal monies spent, and it, hopefully that will, you know, that will bring down the amount of excess funding needed for this position. Within the Sanitation Operations Division itself, there are no fee increases proposed or program changes for this year. Pretty much a business as usual budget. We are requesting to transition some seasonal employees to full-time equivalents, as it's more and more difficult to find staff with commercial driver's licenses and keep them in the current employment market. Last year, Sanitation was actually using our office staff to fill in as drivers at times. And we're hoping that by creating the full-time benefited positions, we believe that we can better attract and get good employees and, again, also be able to provide them the benefits that we believe they deserve. Lorna did a detailed analysis of the life cycle costs of our refuse trucks, and it showed that it will be to our advantage to accelerate the purchase of them and to reduce the overall life cycle costing. So we'll be selling some sooner, and that will give us a higher resale price and also reduce our overall maintenance costs. Due to this, we'll be purchasing eight new refuse vehicles next year as we move to these updated replacement plan. Within the sustainability division, we are going to have a little bit more of a challenge because we are not receiving any payments for recyclables at this time due to poor market conditions. This is creating a funding shortfall for us. To make up for this, we are requesting to move the $1.5 million from the sanitation division into the sustainability fund to help to support the sustainability fund into the future. We realize it's not going to be a long-term, you know, something that will last for us long-term, but it will hold us over until either recycling markets rebound or we find some other options, which are yet to be determined. We're also proposing to move the funding for open space and tree planting from the refuse fund to Parks, who manages these programs. When open space was under sustainability, it was more of a policy-centered program, and it made sense for us to manage it and fund it. 
At that time, sustainability also had enough funding to do that and to help support the general fund, especially during the downturn in the 2008, 2009, 2010 timeframe. But now that program has been completely transferred to parks. It's an ongoing program, and most of what they do is operational and maintenance work. So it makes more sense to have it funded by the program that is actually managing it. Within the $5.5 million fund, which we still have, you know, have carefully been spending and are, you know, lucky to have still some funds left in that, we have five proposed projects. We're requesting $200,000, or excuse me, $115,000 to support a $200,000 grant that we received from the state for electric vehicle charging stations and this money will actually pay the installation costs for those charging stations. We're looking at 25 to 26 that we'll be able to put in this year. We are requesting $100,000 in funding to hire a consultant to assist with a carbon reduction roadmap to work with in-house staff to evaluate technical, regulatory, and legislative changes needed to transition to a low carbon, energy efficient community and to determine pathways to implement the collaborative agreement we are working on with Rocky Mountain Power. We're requesting $85,000 for a local food microgrant fund for small far farmers to help bring local food into the market and stimulate economic development for our local food sector. $45,000 for three years of funding to support the Climate Action Network in Salt Lake City being one of six conveners of the group each of the conveners has pledged either financial or in-kind support to make that successful. Local foundations that we've approached have told us that having conveners provide seed funding and other support for the network will help attract other funding, and we have been lucky to already have been granted, awarded a grant due to the past commitment of, of the conveners to this network. And then finally, we're requesting $39,000 so that solar permitting fees for residents and businesses can be waived for one year as an incentive to get more people to install solar on their roofs. So that's the uh, summary I have, and I'm open to any questions. Great, thank you, Vicki. Questions? Mr. Lisa. Chair, um, I have several questions, Vicki. Thank you so much for um, that thorough review. Um, one, I, I need you to clarify for me um, my concern that uh, we don't necessarily know what we're doing for future funding. Do you, what ideas do you have for that? Well, uh, Councilwoman, I, I do share your concern, <laughs> seeing that it is uh, something that is extremely you know, important for us to ensure that we do have future funding. Recycling markets are starting to rebound now. We're watching that carefully. You know, there's our number one. We've discussed the idea of should there be perhaps some sort of a fee that we could put on, you know, ask for to support sustain sustainability efforts. Another option is could we consider having some sort of general fund monies transferred to sustainability efforts because we do support the general fund in many ways. Those are just a few ideas to start with. We probably have, at, at the rate that we're going through the money, we have about a five-year planning cycle. I so we're lucky that we do have some time, but obviously I'd like to solve this as soon as possible. I don't want to see this become golf that was once <laughs> robust and then <laughs> exactly. becomes a problem. Then, yes. um, this is maybe a question more for the legal team, but um, with the transfer um, of the 1.5 from operations to sustainability, is there any legal problem with that? Margaret, is that moving it from one? portfolio to another. Maybe Lehua knows. Okay. Well, she's coming up. I'll just... From operations to sustainability, is that... Is there, uh, there's not... It's just a matter of shifting it. We don't have to do any anything else? Not, okay. Nope, I don't okay. think there's anything... Lehua, what were you going to say? I was just going to say that when the money was received, and this might be what Vicki was going to say too, but okay. when the money was received, the ordinance was actually drafted in a way that said the money would stay within this larger, what's called a fund class, right? Mm -hmm. And so it, what, at that time, it wasn't specific about whether it would be just operations or just sustainability. Okay, so it can be so, easily shifted right. with that. And, and, and I think the intent at the time was so that it wasn't used for general fund purposes. 
Um, so it was, I, it stuck in my mind because it was specific that it would be kept in this Preserving fund. within that, right. okay. Thank you, thanks for that clarification. Okay, and no, um, I know that at, thanks Margaret. Um, I, I really appreciate that you've been responsive to public comment that we had about not having any recycling bins on Washington Square, and I've noticed we now have them. I'm interested to know, do we have recycling bins at most of our public properties, like parks and things, and oh, where we, are we on that? Yes, we do, and it's something that, in fact, now that we've had, again, it's one of these things that, you know, it, it's revived itself. We're re-evaluating it, but yes, we do have bins in most of the parks. The difficult time we have is, especially, you know, sometimes during the higher season when there's a lot of use, we're able to, you know, see people really segregate. But when it's a park, they're just, just it, it isn't the same, you know, people don't have the same care when they're throwing things away. So we find much higher contamination rates. But as we put the bins out in the park, what we're trying to do is ensure that next to every garbage can is a recycling bin and they're clearly labeled. And, you know, some of the smaller pocket parks, we're probably not going to be able to make that happen. And right. it's just we're, you know, I, I appreciate that you're much making sense. it really clear which is which because I know one problem that I have seen is that um, because the county uses brown garbage cans that I have seen people put trash into our brown cans yes. that does not belong there um, because they live in the county and so they think, oh, it's garbage. And um, I know that people who like to walk in my neighborhood sometimes like to use my brown can for their dog refuse, and um, that doesn't really work. But I, I appreciate in public spots where we're really making it evident that, that that's the case. And then I just noticed a curious number in, in terms of diverted tons um, that uh, we've, we're, our estimate is to go up. We went down from um, 13, 14, uh, a little bit in 14, 15. Do we have any idea why the diverted tons went down when we've really had this push to um, get people to recycle and to use their brown cans? Did, any, any thoughts on that? Because that, I thought um, we were doing a lot better, and I was surprised that we were. So are you referring to the actual numbers, like the tons? Yeah, the, 20, the, the very eight, bottom of that chart versus, where it says total tons received. Well, yes, um, and, but the percentage stayed fairly nearly flat. And... Truthfully, I don't think these percents should have so many significant digits because it is a, a bit of an estimate. But right. um, overall, if you, as a percentage, if you look at the total amount of tonnage received, that went down also. And that right. tends to be almost a national trend that people aren't throwing out as much. And we so think that's it a might good be trend. A, that's a good trend. We okay. would love to keep that yeah. going So we're down. not filling up landfill. Right. Okay. Yes. Great. All right. Thank you so much. Thanks for answering those. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Lisa. Derek. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, you know, I share your concern and Lisa's concern about uh, sustainable funding in the future. And I would ask um, maybe from our chair that we have a follow-up uh, with some proposals maybe later this year or early next year on maybe a fee uh, elsewhere in the city that we might be able to, to tap into if we were going to make this sustainable long term, if not the recycling market, because I know that that can ebb and flow depending on where we're at. I, yes, I, th I would really appreciate that because I think this is going to something that be something that takes all of us putting our heads together to solve. and. When it comes to the recycling markets, we're also working with the county to see if there's something we could do to bring more local markets in because, and this could even be a, a great tag to our economic development work because as we right now are very reliant upon one um, company that's collect taking our recyclables and actually marketing it, if there would be some other options where some of the material, more of the material could stay locally, I think it would really be a benefit to us. Okay, thank you. And I'm going to use this opportunity just to pitch a few questions your way since we don't always have an opportunity to chat face-to-face. -face. Um, but looking at your uh, list here of uh, budget changes, and um, I'm looking at the Culinary Incubator Kitchen, and I know that we awarded that grant to Square Kitchen last year, I believe. It says that that should open at the end of July. Is that still the 
That's the last the last uh, data I have too. Okay. Yeah, I know they're working hard, and I drove by there a few days ago, and it's a, there's a lot going on. Oh, really? Yes. Because I drove by, and it didn't look like anything was going on. Oh, really? Well, the, the door was wide open, and there were people good. inside. So. Okay, good. <laughs> well, if there were people inside, it must mean that they're doing something. That's true. Okay. Um, and on the uh, breakdown of the use for the $5.5 million, mm -hmm. um, I see this one-time replace two-cycle engine. Is that for uh, city uh, tools, or is that a grant program for residents? That was for city. Okay. And, uh, yes, we had two years where we did did that over a course of two years, and that has been completely done. So essentially, we've replaced all two-cycle engines that are reasonable to replace to less polluting engine motors. At some point in the future, would you be prepared to have a proposal for a grant program for residents? Is that something that you've thought about? We have thought about it. It is something that the state has done the because CARE they program, have the right? CARE, yeah, and it's through their U Care grants also because they have quite a bit of funding available. The cost per amount of pollution reduced is quite a bit higher. So it's something that we haven't looked at doing ourselves just because we feel like we'd probably need quite a bit of funding, but we'd be more than happy to talk about, you know, to do some calculations and see what it would take. Okay. I'd love yeah. to talk to you about that a little bit later Great. on. Um, and finally, um, just a curiosity, if you'll indulge me for a second, how are we doing as a city with diverting residential green waste? Can you talk to that at all? Well. What we are actually collecting, I think we're doing a really good job of diverting, and we're working closely with the landfill right now to really improve the composting operation because we want to ensure that no green waste gets into the landfill. I mean, it's, it creates methane. It, you know, it, it's got a lot of negative side effects, even though you know, what's in the landfill now is going to create methane for many years. If, if we can slow that, it would be to our advantage. We're working on... Um, not only the, what the landfill has for their composting operation, which has really this year they've improved the quality, and I understand that it looks like they may be, you know, at certain points possibly running out of what's available to sell, which is exactly what we want to see happening. And then um, we have provided the small amount of funding, and Lauren has been working with a composting specialist to do a small pilot project. And if that is something we can then take up to a larger scale, we're hoping that we could have even a better product out there. What is the timeline for the pilot project? Uh, it's going on. It's, it's just about to start now. So, you know, after it's probably going to take most of the summer to really run some composting through, compost through and then see how we can compare that to, you know, and see if we can get some, you know, probably be able to do it faster and come up with a better product. You know, Mr. Chair, I would really value a follow-up at some point later this year, if we could keep that in mind, uh, just to follow up on this pilot program and the other things that you've got going on, as well as maybe um, a better understanding of uh, future system financial sustainability for the department. Thank you. I would appreciate that. And scheduling a walk-through at the uh, Square Kitchen, is that At Square it is? Kitchen, once they're up and running, July. I'd love to see that. Yeah. yeah, It's done in July. Let's go. It would be through. wonderful. Well, and, and we would definitely, you know, once it's open or in the process of opening, we'll be right. having a lot of... Uh, press and media. And I was just going to say that the way that the intent is worded right now, it's for any new departments or new department heads that we would maybe schedule that mid-year briefing. So this would be included in that, I would imagine. Thank you. Thanks. We'll go Stan and then Aaron and then Andrew. Vicki, um, refuse vehicles. Um, Clean vehicles, I'm assuming. Are we doing natural gas or clean diesel or? Uh, both. Both? Both, okay. yes. We just decided we'd try a few of the new clean diesels because one of the main concerns we have is being completely dependent upon natural gas in case there's some sort of an emergency situation. My if understanding they, is they may hold up a little better, too. And we're thinking they might, but we haven't tried them, although the actual emissions are supposed to be about the same as natural gas. And um, does this completely upgrade our fleet, or do we still have some out there? We're, that... we're finally selling the last couple old diesels, yes. Right. And with, a fa with the shorter replacement schedule, it's, it will still take us a few years to totally get onto that replacement schedule, okay. but I think it's going to really help us have some, some good, clean vehicles. 
Thanks. In that thread, I can't remember uh, what the results of the question was years ago, but I feel like we talked about the potential for same site garbage pickup for um, air quality reasons. And I get with a natural gas vehicle that's different, but is, have we in, looked into that potential in our city? Oh, having the, uh, all the cans on one side of the street? Yeah. Or, we have not. And I know it's something we kind of put out there. It would, you know, I think we could consider it, at least on smaller residential streets, if there would be some way to get, you know, but I guess our concern is, you know, how, much, how complicated would it get? But we could definitely can look at that. Right. It seems like the kind of thing that would do well with a, pot, a pilot project in a neighborhood mm -hmm. and that we could, put, we could probably calculate some benefits without even doing it mm -hmm. um, just on, on the fuel saved and on the emissions saved by not driving twice down the street but once down the street. Right. Um, so anyway, I wonder if I could throw that out there. Maybe we could set up a meeting. Sounds good. I know good. that there's other cities that have done it and um, we could find out more about the lessons learned from those perhaps, but in terms of looking at air quality reductions and uh, the things we have control over, that is one. Mm -hmm. So I appreciate that we have some of the cleaner garbage trucks in the city or in the, in the state, but even still, um, they make a lot of trips. Yeah, let's talk. And for all the sleeping yep. babies on those streets that have to be woken Same. from their naps by the garbage truck coming down twice, <laughs> uh, I have a few things, but first, Vicki, I should have said, I'm so glad you're here. Mayor, great job oh. keeping Vicki Bennett on board. <laughs> she has been a wealth of institutional knowledge here and has built one of the best teams of all of the division departments in the city. Um, you guys are amazing. You do great work. And you're definitely leading that curve towards sustainability nationally. Um, and you, you keep me on my heels, so I like that. Um, about the collection from cans that we've talked a little bit about and that most of the revenue is coming from the larger cans. Uh, residents are using the 90-gallon cans, and that's where most of our revenue comes from. I wondered if you've identified a tipping point. We certainly want the smaller cans to be tempting for people for uh, multiple reasons. And so keeping the cost down makes sense for some time. But I wonder if you've identified when we get to some amount of adoption to smaller cans, when we need to increase the fee on the smaller cans in order to cover the expense of the program. We haven't, dis we haven't actually calculated a specific number. It, the, it's still smaller than we'd like it to be. We really would like to have residents move to the smaller cans. And again, it's one of those cases where the more successful you are, you're working yourself out of the funding that you're needing to keep the programs going. But at the same time, the more that we can have a, a you know, smaller amount for the 40 gallon and really increase the price for the larger is the incentive. You know, and that's a lot of the reason we do that is because of that incentive. As we get to the point where more and more residents might switch, I think we can, we'll definitely be doing some calculations. But it's a slow but steady process, and we've been partnering with Momentum and the glass recycling. As they go around to various areas and talk to people about signing up for glass, we've asked them to hand out some information, and we find that we're getting just as many people to downsize their cans as they are getting people to sign up. And so that's been very effective. So well, tell me some of the, just really briefly, a benefit or a couple benefits from people downsizing the cans. Well, what we're are they actually producing less trash when we have a smaller garbage can? That doesn't seem make sense. Some people just don't have as much trash and they don't realize it. So by really talking to them about what is recyclable, they'll put more into the recycling can and use their trash can more effectively. I think those are probably the two main things that we'll see. Okay. Vicki, can I tell you what it's made a difference in my house? Your person went and sold my wife. I was so mad. We downsized. I can't even tell you. <laughs> We downsized to a smaller can, and what it's forced us to do is recycle more. And I so. want to remember that you are the person objecting to the increased fee on the larger can, so maybe we can revisit that. <laughs> no, I said, no, no, no. He's downside his can now. Mine was okay for the larger mm -hmm. can increase. I said that we didn't want to reduce the smaller can size cost. 
I said, I, let's I maintain that. it the same. Yes. I, I just want that. to make sure we keep the yard waste can huge uh, so <laughs> that my kids can jump in it to smash the leaves the down, and down that it won't mm -hmm. tip over because it's nice and broad based. It's a really fun thing to do to have your kids smash the leaves. Okay, I'll quit talking about kids now. The EV expansion, um, I hope that you'll have a chance to talk with Laura Fritz about the economic development attraction of having an EV infrastructure. We're going to have some serious EV charging in this city. I'm so excited about it. So much more than we have right now, which is still better than anywhere else in the state, maybe. Um, yeah. And we are in just two seconds of my soapbox, we're going to look back on the opportunities we have created and some that we've passed up on EV expansion in the city. In the coming years, we're going to look back and go, oh my gosh, how did we not do more to support this? The curve of expansion of electric vehicles is, is going to take off, I think, and we are doing a great uh, service to our <coughs> residents, but to the economic development potential, the kind of uh, recruitments that big companies want to make have people who want to drive these kind of cars. Um, the third part I wanted to mention is kudos to our mayor for the carbon reduction goals that you're supporting and setting. Um, they're aggressive and they should be. We have an incredible opportunity right now. My last question is, is kudos and this Rocky Mountain Power Franchise Agreement that we're working on. I'd love a, if you can give us a small update and if we can set a time to have a better update in the future. But um, you, Mayor, being aggressive about those carbon reduction goals is uh, a beacon for other cities and their future potential to renegotiate their franchise agreements when the opportunities come up, uh, um, come up for them. And what we do will set the standard for the future, not just for our residents, but for all these muni municipalities. So I'm so grateful that you have that kind of vision um, and that you're pursuing that and that Vicki and her team get to carry that vision into the negotiation. So can you give us an update on where, and maybe if you have a, a timeline or how those are going? Uh, well, we have had a chance to sit down with Rocky Mountain Power a couple of times and I guess it, at this point, it's, you know, we had a few ideas that we put out. They had a couple of things where they said, well, here's a deal breaker for them, and we have talked back and forth. We've now updated what we'd like to see in, in the uh, cooperative agreement, and it's back at their desks. And once they have had a little time to digest what we've suggested, what I think we need to do is we'll probably sit down with Rocky Mountain Power and perhaps us and looking at real specifics as to what is going to be something that, you know, be things that we can agree on, can't agree on, and at that point we'll uh, take it to the mayor and brief her and be briefing you on where we are. So time frame, I would hope we can get this moving through the summer. I don't think so. Every time it goes one way or the other, it seems to take a couple weeks to get a little bit further. Um, we are really planning on tying the, what our goals are to the franchise agreement, and so as they are asking for you know, some length of time of a franchise, we'll be basically ensuring that we have some sort of stop gap in it, whereas if we don't feel like we're moving forward with them appropriately, then we can say that you know, we'll be wanting to negotiate further. We, we don't so, want to leave. So we don't want to... Uh, Vicki and the mayor, if you would be mm -hmm. open to it, we'd love to have a have you come in and, and do a briefing on it in July. Okay. And that way mm -hmm. we can give our input beforehand and not at the tail end of it. Yeah, we definitely will want to have your input before anything is close. Okay. Yeah. So we'll, we'll try and get that scheduled in, in July and we can move okay. forward that way. That sounds good. Great. Sorry, Erin, didn't mean to interrupt. It's all right. No, I know we're short on time. Uh, that's all. Andrew. Just a point of clarification, I know you're all talking about these um, struggles in the budget going forward. Um, so I understand correctly, our, our, our fee, our large can fees are actually what's funding part of it. Our uh, landfill revenue is funding the, the office as well, is that correct? So the fees for the actual pickup of everyone's refuse mm -hmm 
basically funds that pickup. Yeah. So it's a it's its own little box. But it's really the large cans, though, that they, they kick that because the small cans don't pay for themselves. Is that correct? Or they they're about the break even point. About break even for the yes. small cans. Yes. Yeah. More kind of, and of course it depends how you play with the numbers and such, but more or less those are about that's about the break even okay. point. And then the separate fund is from the fact that we're owners of the landfill, mm -hmm. so we get a dividend for every ton that is. Place you know, there. put out there, we yeah. get a small dividend and that adds up. So that goes in and that funds our office operations. So this is my concern, and obviously you know this, but our, our, our revenue is coming at the expense of our goals, essentially. I mean, we're trying to decrease our, our landfill, and that's how we're paying for our, our, our sustainability. And this is, yeah. I mean, going back to that and the other things we identified, and um, right. I'm not saying that we don't fund these things because they should pay off long term, but we're going to need some real serious discussions, obviously, about um, structurally how this is going to look going forward. Um, otherwise, we're going to dig ourselves a big hole that we already have for other departments. Um, my, my second question, I guess, also is um, I wanted to make sure that we have some very specific um, and clear objectives in all these areas that, that we can come back uh, in six months or a year and know um, what what's happening, right? If our objective is to decrease our landfill, um, right, tonnage every year, uh, if our objective is to increase the number of homes producing solar power, if our objective is city building, whatever it is, um, we're going to need to show that because I'm, I'm going to have a hard, okay, from a, from a neighborhood perspective, it's hard to talk to the neighbors about the benefit initially, especially folks who struggle with the utility bills, mm -hmm. which are probably going to keep increasing. Um, so we're going to have to have some really clear conversations about how this is actually helping us very directly because we all want clean air and clean water, et cetera, but it's harder to quantify that when you're choosing between your rent and your food and your, um, your clean water and air. So, and, and that's exactly why we want to ensure that we put that equity lens on everything that we look at for sustainability. And you're right. I mean, it seems like whenever you're trying to do the right thing, I mean, our public utilities runs into the same issue with their water conservation programs. And, mm -hmm. You know, you're trying to minimize what you're creating. You're minimizing your waste, and it's what we've used to make money off of. But we're clear that the the small cans are close to breaking even for us. Yes, yeah, that's it's what we. Not we've, too far underneath, or is it at? You think it's it's pretty at? close to at. Okay. Again, as you you know, what do you exactly consider? You know, your base, and what do you put in there? You know, sure. we, without playing with too many numbers, we think that's that is pretty much a fixed cost. Okay, it's one of the questions we had as a council was, are we undercutting ourselves badly by doing that? Mm -hmm. um, do we need to address that? So it would be helpful okay. to know coming forward in the next budget cycle if that's a major issue we need to look at. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Vicki, I'm going to go back to Cairns. Uh, we've talked over the years about uh, the desire for some residents, uh, particularly single uh, individuals who don't produce a lot of waste uh, or, or smaller lots, to have smaller cans for blue and brown. Yeah. Do we have those available now? We do. Okay, yes. and so we just need to encourage people to contact the office, and they can be swapped out for yep. so they're all the smaller size as well. Yes, and yeah, it was just a storage. Them space mm -hmm. issue. So. Exactly. I, yeah. Okay. We did order a few. Great. And, yeah. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, Vicki and the Mayor, for being here. And of course, Lingo, thanks, thanks for being at the great. table to answer our questions. Uh, we are moving on to, we're going to skip the break and actually go into uh, item number five, which is, and then you know, we need to go into closed session. Mr. Chair, move that we um, recess into closed session for uh, discussions on employee compensation. Second. I think we have to use the um, the wording because you're just talking about strategy with regard to labor negotiations. negotiations. Mm -hmm. Strategy and collective bargaining. Collective strategy bargaining. Strategy and collective bargaining. On collective bargaining. Okay. okay. So included. Are you good with that second? And you're still with those changes? We'll roll call this. Lisa? Derek? Yes. Charlie? Yes. I'm a yes. Stan? Yes. Aaron? Yes. Andrew? Yes. And he's a yes. So everybody that shouldn't be here, you know who you are. We invite you to leave quietly. Right. It'll be
Brian, how about introducing yourself for us, since sure. this is the first for some. <laughs> uh, my name is Brian Roberts. I'm a senior city attorney in the city attorney's office. I'm also designated as the chief negotiator uh, for the mayor when it comes to negotiating the uh, memorandum of understanding uh, with each of our three bargaining units. And uh, my understanding is uh, just like an update, and so I'll give a brief update and then can answer questions. Um, at, at this point, we have functionally gone to impasse with all three bargaining units. Um, it's important to remember this doesn't affect the actual underlying contract and MOU. Uh, two of the bargaining units are covered by multi-year MOUs that are still ongoing and won't, won't, won't terminate for one year and two years, respectively. ASHME is the uh, only MOU that is up by, uh, on its terms and conditions. We've actually had an agreement there to extend that for an additional year. So the underlying terms and conditions will extend for one additional year and we're going to uh, start negotiating on uh, renewing that contract fairly quickly in, in August. Uh, so what we've gone to impasse on is compensation. Um, so really that's the, that's the only issue. Um, the process now according to the bargaining resolution is that the city council and the mayor will quote unquote resolve the issue. And what that means is that the compensation for the bargaining units just like other employees will now become part of the budgetary process. Uh, the mayor has recommended that uh, the wage schedule to be adopted in the, in the course of that uh, process to, to include the 1.25% increase that was part of the original uh, recommended budget for non-represented employees and also the uh, funding of what's quote, colloquially called the steps, the years of service increases. So those, those are the two recommendations that the mayor has made for the, for the wage schedule. Those will be transmitted to the council shortly. Can I provide any other information or? Questions? Yeah, just a logistics question, Cindy. Does that become something we just adopt as the, part of the budget uh, package or do we need to individually look at those? Um, items for adoption. You would receive them in advance of your uh, brief or your um, final adoption on the 14th. They would be available uh, in your packet publicly by next Friday. They um, usually, it's just basic boilerplate language usually, and so what you would want to look for is to be sure that that 1.25% okay. is in there. As soon as we receive them from the administration, perhaps we already have, I think they're on their way though, then they would be emailed automatically out to all of the council members. And as we look at the budget next uh, Tuesday, we generally package a lot of items. They can be packaged okay. as part of the rest, Great. yes. Thank you. All right, thanks, Brian. Thank you. Appreciate it. On to item six, unresolved issues. Uh, we have Jennifer Bruno and Lehua Weaver from council staff. So Jennifer, since Charlie and Stan were both out um, last week, how about doing a little recap for us? Yes. So um, what you see here, um, what you see here on the general fund key changes represents everything that was straw polled last week that had a majority of council support. So there were a couple of things that were straw polled that there wasn't a majority support. So we left those off of the key changes to revisit tonight. But the big changes, I guess you could say on the key changes item is um, the first is actually a decision you made in conjunction with budget amendment number four and that changes the economic development director to be fully funded in the general fund. The next is the finance position for the RDA to be added in finance, and that's offset with half revenue from the RDA. Um, the other uh, add was a street lighting fee, which was left out of the mayor's budget, but it needs to be addressed. And then the council straw hold support for adding $300,000 to the budget to cover a geo bond public process um, in anticipation of a potential recreation open space geo bond next year. So um, that's added as a placeholder in the non-departmental budget. So that gets us to a deficit position of 481,000. With that, um, we've received some preliminary revenue um, information from the state tax commission and from the county on new growth and on the judgment levy. Um, and so if you want, I can go through some of that and I would assume the council's okay with us adding that to the spreadsheet, but 
I don't know if you want to discuss it. I guess you're not required to accept um, new growth property tax revenue. So the, um, based on the estimates, uh, it is approximately $954,000 more than what was recommended in the mayor's recommended budget. So the mayor's recommended budget, if you'll remember, had a placeholder of about 780000 I think, for um, new growth that they had sort of tentatively put in the CIP budget if it came. And it it did materialize and then some. So, so it's above and beyond. So the actual new growth is a, a 1.7 1. 1. million. Yeah. And Jennifer, those numbers will be f official tomorrow by Friday. They're required by law to be finalized by Wednesday. So we'll know on Wednesday if they're finalized. But but, um, but your expectation is they're going to be really yeah. close. We, we've had conversations with the staff of the State Tax Commission, and they're not aware of any outstanding major items that would swing that in a major way. So um, fairly confident. The judgment levy um, is also a little bit higher than what was recommended in the mayor's budget. When the mayor puts together the budget, um, the finance staff doesn't have the benefit of knowing these numbers. They're projections. Um, and so the judgment levy exact amount isn't finalized until later in June, just like the property tax numbers aren't finalized until um, June. And so that exact amount is $111,000 above what was in the mayor's recommended budget. That's a one-time revenue source, though, as opposed to the new growth, which is an ongoing revenue source. And so. um, Jennifer, as, uh, have, uh, we've been having some conversations about capturing the unspent dollars uh, for the social work positions at the police department and it's 300 and something, 80,000. 80, Those are not reflected as captured revenue, correct? Right. So we left that aside because the council uh, was not straw polling all of the other items relating to that. So we left that as one sort of discussion. So point. I'm just wondering, uh, Mr. Chair, I don't think there's a. I mean, it seems to me that there's an expectation from our discussions that we will capture and spend that money. I think there's some discussion about what well, we'll spend it on, but I'm wondering if we should just go ahead and straw poll capturing that in the revenue. Um, Let's uh, straw poll um, the 950000 Yes. Before, before we straw poll that, um, Stan, what would you think about, uh, I mean, we put that money towards social workers um, to deal with the homeless situation rather than just putting it back into the, the pile that can be spent anywhere. What if we earmarked it for um, homeless or, you know, something related to homeless services in the area so that it doesn't get spent elsewhere? Would you be comfortable with that? Yeah, I'm okay with that. I, I uh, just think we need to reflect that yeah, we've I got agree. that as we have our conversation. So whether it gets captured initially or whether we add it in at the end, we, we probably should, you're suggesting we just track separately the, two the sort of homeless yep. focused uh, or areas focused or uh, probably more appropriately in the downtown yeah, area the downtown around area. those we can start. We yeah. can start directly from that 300,000 uh, and then if there's extra or something then we can figure it out. We, we grouped those items together um, kind of on that basis that, that there's a, a variety of options, including social workers and including other things in that area. Um, and that's item A in the unresolved issues staff report um, on page two. That first item in the main chart kind of groups, groups those things together. So The use of fund balance on page two. Is that what you're talking about? Jennifer? Yes. Okay. Uh, sorry, p p page two, uh, item A, and the mm -hmm. first item in the chart. Right. Great. So let's straw poll the, the capture of new uh, growth, property tax growth. Uh, council members, if you're in favor of capturing that growth so that we can balance the budget. Okay. Okay. That's six. Lisa is not here. So, whoa, it just went green. Just Amazing like that. how that works, right? And then we have to do the judgment levy of 150. Um, the mayor's recommended budget included $500,000 placeholder for the judgment levy. The actual judgment levy was 611,000, so the difference would be 111,187. Okay. So let's let's uh, strapple that, capture that money as well. Okay. Okay. Lisa is the only one that abstained because she's not here. Okay. So um, if the council's okay, we can work through the um, chart, uh, starting with the social workers' vacancy savings mm -hmm. item, 
or we can go to items from last week. So whatever. I, I think um, for me it would make a lot more sense just so Charlene and Stan, if they had any, uh, if there were some items that were taken off the list that they would like to try and put back on the list, give them that opportunity to, to pitch it to the council. Everything's, yeah, sure. everything's on for me. So. I have uh, the impound lot uh, is one that i um, been thinking about, and I know that the total budget for that is significant. It's over $600,000. But the proposal from the mayor was to phase that out and not immediately just cease operations July 1. And so I'm wondering about the opportunity of perhaps funding that for just a short period into the year to look at a couple of options for capturing um, some additional revenue, which we just haven't had time to explore. One of those including uh, encouraging the police department to access the impound lot. The other um, concern I have is that uh, a significant dollar amount there um, is related to transferring those staff positions over to enforcement to collect additional parking revenue. And I'm just incredibly uncomfortable about um, projecting additional parking revenue as part of a balancing scheme for our budget. We just have a long history of failing miserably at doing that. And so I don't, I, I'm not, I'm concerned that those projections for additional revenue are not realistic so that we actually are not going to increase revenue by transferring those positions. So what I would suggest is maybe a request to the administration that what it would cost uh, to keep the impound lot functioning, say, two or three months into the year with an expectation that they could come back to us with a realistic projection of what, uh, options we may have for maintaining that lot. And, and we may eventually close it, but I don't think it actually impacts the budget significantly because they were going to phase it out anyway. Is that accurate, Jennifer? Or um, you're, you're twisting I your mean, face. We, well, you're giving me that look <laughs> like I said something wrong. No, I, I think it's just a little complicated in terms of the, I, I guess I'm, I'm thinking just practically about the, how the budget will be adopted. And I think there were two positions that were vacant. Um, at the impound lot that would need to be filled in order to keep the operations going. Um, Currently vacant? Yes. And so I don't know how that would uh, Every time I talk to you, you shoot, of, you shoot down my impound I'm lot. I'm not trying to shoot it down. You know, I, I, but I wonder if, there, if there's a w maybe the administration <laughs> Help maybe, somebody shed some could, light on this. maybe somebody could help us out. Lisa Schaefer can help us out. And, and, uh, and uh, council members, I think you're also getting some of these communications. We've had a, a, actually what I consider a surprising number of people um, advocating that we keep this service available to the public. Uh, I mean, the fact that we've got four or five emails, uh, I mean, it's kind of incredible to me that someone is saying, please. Uh, maintain the opportunity to tow my car. Um, but I think it's a reflection of some shifts we made several years ago to the quality of the customer service for people who um, were impounded by, by the city uh, as opposed to other impound operations. Right. I definitely want to be sensitive to that. So to answer the question about the cost involved, the numbers, and I'm going to look to my right a little bit here, do not include, the 650 does not include projections on the, on the um, compliance side. It does include the fact that we have kept open three positions uh, that we would eliminate. So those, those positions would have to be included. And additionally, we have some revenue that's listed there for the sale of existing vehicles and the sale of anticipated vehicles between now and uh, you know the end of the month, and uh, the phasing as proposed is um, is more about kind of cleaning up the existing operations, not about bringing in additional business. Because keep in mind there are some uh, time limits involved when you impound a vehicle, so you have to hold it for a certain number of days. There's there's specific legal noticing requirements, and then we can we can clean those out of the. So lot. your expectation would be that you would cease towing operations July one. Not cease towing operations, but cease towing to our lot. That's yes. And storage other than disposing of property that you already got stored there. Correct. And, and we're actually in the middle of trying to accommodate some of the customer service aspects that we've gotten feedback on into ordinance. Uh, Jennifer's been 
excellent in communicating with us, and we're meeting with our council to to make those those things a reality. So, uh, yeah, I'm I'm not going to. Clearly, I don't want to. We don't have six hundred thousand um, dollars, but my true concern is the is founded in the feedback we're getting about that service as provided by the city in respect to the customer service aspect and the difficulty in finding that service available out in the broader community. So. Uh, if I may, Mr. Yeah. Chair. I wonder if the, I agree with the, the concerns about public's, uh, public interface with that and the concerns we have about bad experiences, but I'm, I'm still wondering I'll, when I read the emails um, if it's still a confusing issue because we're, we're lumping all impound lots together and not just city impound lot. Um, because it's, even if the city impounds my vehicle through the police, it doesn't go to our city lot. Um, that's why I'm wondering if we're, we're concerned about impound lots in general or about our lot itself. And if we need to address the bigger picture of even if we close our lot or keep it open, it's still a public uh, interface issue. And maybe we can look, look at that. We talked about before about how do we help people um, advocate for themselves in the process with maybe our lot or who we contract with or in general. Um, Lisa, is your intention in the proposed budget to maintain an interface between some city employee contact and the towing agency that we potentially might contract with that could facilitate um, that customer service aspect with uh, Yes, um, uh, we recommended, and the mayor has forwarded that recommendation, retaining one of our supervisors that's part of our compliance slash impound operation and one office facilitator. Their sole responsibility would be to coordinate between whether, whether we do a sole source between one uh, tow company or whether we do a rotation uh, similar to what the police are utilizing now. Um, we, we would do a coordination their sole responsibility would be to, to take care of that coordination between the city's tows and these tow companies. And so one of the services we provide now is a phone contact information for weekend contacts after hours. Would that continue? Absolutely. Okay. It would I, be a requirement of the contract. That gives me a much higher level of confidence that that could happen. Yeah, I mean, we are sensitive to it, Council Member, and I, and I do appreciate this because I do think that the business itself, as has been discussed openly, has a pretty difficult history, and, and we do want to be sensitive to the citizens who get their cars towed. Um, and I do think what Council Member Johnston has brought up is legitimate. There is some confusion about what tows we're talking about. Uh, the tows that we're talking about are initiated by city staff right. for uh, cars inside of the city. This does not affect any private lot. This does not regulate any private lot. That's, a, that's another conversation, and it certainly is one that we're willing to talk to you about at a future date, but it really isn't part of this conversation now. Uh, you want to straw pull it to see if you can keep it open for a couple No, I'm, pr I'm pretty sure where that will go. Okay. So uh, I just appreciate the opportunity to talk about it. Thank you. And, I, and I, <coughs> I, I think perhaps we have a legislative intent component that we, do. we might need to capture. So we, we do, and it's pretty specific in terms of the kinds of consumer protection things um, that okay. you've noted. Um, the administration and the attorney's office has been working on incorporating that, and so that will be before the council soon. So hopefully, hopefully soon, soon, soon. Yeah, sure. <laughs> but soon you've got some information yeah. for us. Well, or a question, really. Um, I guess I, I was thinking that you were going to have some transition time that might give us the uh, chance to get a contract in place or some contracts in place. And it sounds like that won't be the case. It won't be possible to get a contract in place by by July 1. We currently do have one contract in place for towing services for the compliance department. It, it is, doesn't have this criteria that it, the council has talked about to protect consumers. Correct. And so the gap would be filled by that contract, and we're working diligently to make sure that we incorporate this other language. And, uh, you know, whether or not, like I said, we do a sole source or we do this, this particular one that we already have a contract with an addendum or some kind of rider that would help us get through um, this time between the closure and when we can have that 
final contract in place, and that's that's the direction we're looking at. I was just wondering if the council would be interested in asking the attorney's office to look at another angle, which would be not to have a contract necessarily or until you can get a contract, uh, establish an ordinance that just says that the to be on the either police towing list rotation or public services towing list rotation, uh, you must meet the following criteria. And then only contact in the rotation list those firms that meet that criteria. I, I appreciate that very much, and it is one of the options that we're looking at because the police department currently does use a rotating contract, and we could um, – you know, tag on to that for, for the time being until we get these things in place. Right. But so, what I'm saying I, is not yes. a contract. It's not as a contract. I think that they just, what I'm saying is to establish that criteria to say if you are, um, you may only be on this rotating list if you meet, if you meet the criteria. criteria. I appreciate so that. we could ask the attorney's office if the council's interested in that. I don't yeah, know I think that I actually would appreciate that because I'm not certain that there is currently any criteria for being on that list. It's just a rotation. And if, if you have the ability to collaborate with the police department, who's also doing towing services, right. that would make a lot of sense that we do these uh, as very similar um, services are very similar criteria because when you get towed, it's the it, the perception from the public is it's the city uh, and I towed. Think, and, and I think the challenge would be to get the um, ordinance in con in time for con the council's consideration next week because it would be an ordinance, correct? Is that sort of what you're thinking? That's or? what I was suggesting, but I think that would be easier than trying to rush contracts through right. because that obviously can't happen before right. the end of July or August or September, right? just to stop gap measures at all. So, Lisa, you. Do you, uh, have you already started that process of developing some criteria as you're looking at a uh, contract? And, and maybe that's a different angle that could accelerate this process is rather than saying going out to RFP or contract, that if you participate in the same rotation of pre-selected uh, towing companies uh, based on our uh, minimum criteria, that might be a faster and a, a more responsive way to go. Uh, we appreciate that input very much. And, yes, we are working on it. We've been uh, contacting other jurisdictions that have similar uh, type situations, and we're trying to replicate some of that and then incorporate some of the specific requirements uh, that we all share, frankly. So, yes, thank you. Um, Mr. Chair, thank you very much, Lisa. Am I good? I, I, I'm not. <laughs> if we can go forward with that general intent, I'm comfortable with that. Great. The other um, component that was discussed last week wa was uh, the social work funding, and I just want to make a, 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 a quick case in particular for me as a reminder of, of our intent last year for the social work program and to potentially look at the possibility of funding this uh, these unfunded three positions that are going forward in the social work program. I understand that the police department is close to announcing this program uh, within a few weeks, I believe. So as we were looking at this model last year and as we were talking about how to expand the visibility of the police department in the downtown core, in particular around homeless issues, we looked at a couple of models nationally, in particular one in Seattle, where, we, where they hired social workers um, to step in and do what our police department is already doing, which is interfacing with homeless populations um, in high-risk neighborhoods in the city um, in order to uh, assess their need, uh, provide assistance where possible and available, and to connect them to existing services. Um, one of the real intents of this for me was to expand the visibility of the police in the downtown core, and I think that's getting missed a little bit in this conversation about social workers versus um, uh, police officers. Um, in that area. So with, with the uh, addition of eight social workers who are specifically focused in the core where homeless populations are spending their time during the day, 
um, th these individuals would be identified as working with the police department. Very specifically, the Seattle model has them in police jackets and they're part of the police department. Um, picking up uh, the responsibility which our police officers are currently providing, which is this assessment, what's going on, um, how are you doing, are you injured, are you okay, can I help you get somewhere, can I maybe get you inside for a minute, whatever that might look like. The intent was to add eight people in a shift phase, um, uh, additional visibility of eight people in that core, but also to free up police officers who are currently providing this service. And I know that those police officers assigned downtown are, are spending a lot of time um, talking to homeless people who are dealing with mental health issues and substance use issues and, and other complications related to their homelessness. So I don't want to lose that in our conversation, and I would make a pitch that we still want to consider funding those three additional positions because I believe that gets to one of our co uh, core goals in this neighborhood, which is increasing police visibility. And it does it at a lower cost than providing police officers out there. And I also think it provides an expanded service for the police department. So I just wanted to suggest that um, that might be something we should consider either in a partial year or a full year funding those three additional positions for the social works, uh, social workers in the police department. Okay. Do you want to straw poll that, Stan? Uh, yeah, or have discussion around it. I don't know if there are other, you know, Andrew, concerns. Andrew, looks like or, you're, you're sure. ready to speak. Uh, I'm all for more outreach down there, and we've talked about this. Um, I, I think it's a big piece of us going forward. I also think that we don't have more resources right now. Um, we can have as many people in the street trying to hook people with the resources as we want. We don't have the resources to hook them up with. We're also losing at least two outreach workers from a private agency down there for lack of funding who have been doing this for the last two years on the streets in Rio Grande working with the police. That's what their job has been, and they've lost funding. Um, so I, I'm not opposed to it, Stan. I'm, my concern has been that it's, this has taken so long to wrap up and just get it going, let alone build the rapport with the folks and then clarify what their role is going to be while we're losing established workers already on the street. Um, and I'd, I'd love to see us allocate as many funds as we can to this issue, um, but I want to make sure that we're clear in um, exactly um, how we're doing it and it fits the bigger picture. And I, at some point I want to talk about, you know, A, again, the, the current one-time vacancy from last year, from this current year. Um, but I, I don't know that continuing the allocation of three, how long is it going to take us to get there, and how long are we going to show any tangible results, I guess, is my concern with um, the extra three. So, so I, I absolutely agree that one of the challenges um, with anyone providing services in this neighborhood is there really aren't a lot of resources for where to take them. Um, uh, but at the same time, one of the critical needs we have for this population is identifying, clearly identifying what those gaps in services are. And that's one of the, as I talked to the police chief about this program, that was one of the priorities of these social workers was gathering information about the actual assessment and priority of need that we're not meeting for these populations. Um, frankly, my perspective is that the city does not even begin to have the capacity to fund those large-scale um, national mental health services sorts of programs. But in order for us to make really good cases at the state and at the county where I think that those are our best options, we, we could, uh, the more information, the more data we have about that gap, the more um, compelling um, our uh, case will be for those ongoing services. So I, I totally understand there's not mm -hmm. enough for both and that the truly bigger gap is the gap you referenced in where, where do people access mental health and substance use services. Um, and, and that's the ultimate um, challenge for, for talking about homelessness. If we combine mental health, substance use, and affordable housing, um, those are, I mean, that covers the, the need for our homeless populations, and we as a city, as a municipality, 
can't even begin to address that program, our role truly becomes one of advocating for those people who are part of our population. I also, I think the data is there. I think the outreach workers down there from type of VOA and the road home particularly and St. Vinny's, I think we, we've gathered a lot of information about who's down there. Um, that's what they've been doing for a while. Now, whether we're accessing with the police department or not, we need to talk about that. But I think we have been gathering the information. What we're going to do with it is another question. I'd love to have access to all of it, but I think that I don't want to recreate things that we already have going on. If we're going to lose those outreach workers, maybe we need to do this. But I'm not convinced that having eight versus four is going to, or eight versus five, excuse me, um, is going to make that huge difference um, versus maybe allocating funds elsewhere for the same purpose. Another idea. So, Mr. Chair, I just want to echo where Mr. Uh, Councilmember Stan, uh, Stan Penfold is going with this. I think it's. I think it's an innovative and good approach for this neighborhood um, because we can't police. So I would be, I was advocating for this money to be redirected to foot patrol, right? And I still am. But I just want to say that I appreciate where he's going with this because we can't police ourselves out of what's going on in that neighborhood. Um, you know, what's going on nationwide with opiates, uh, we are clearly just addressing a symptom of a larger problem and um, you know being the district four representative this is the beating heart of my district in some ways and there is a cry for resources to be directed toward immediate solutions and while we have some of these social workers hired I would like to see how the four do over the next year um, and you know I just want to kind of echo where Andrew's going with this um, while also being sympathetic to where Councilmember Penfold is coming from and I just wanted to add my two cents. This can also go back to A though and then we need to talk about that um, and see if I'm meeting things. Go for it Aaron. Uh, I, I'd be supportive of us continuing the funding to get the three up to the eight that we we funded last year. Um, I. It's slow going, but we're just about, it sounds like in my talks with PD, over the hump of uh, establishment and getting someone to do the hiring and getting uh, Lana on board, who is the, the director manager type position of the social workers. I hate to cut it off right now as they're kind of getting their feet under them. But additionally, it's um, they aren't a resource that can only be used in the Rio Grande neighborhood. They are one that I'm talking with PD about um, utilizing for sex workers on North Temple and on State Street. That these, uh, that those women are generally are women, and that they don't have the same access to resources that the homeless population on Rio Grande has, and they need specific type case management that really is best done by a social worker. Um, and the, the, those people that when they are hired and we have the capacity to do that kind of outreach um, and sex workers are picked up, uh, the, we will have that connection between the police officer who is with them on 13 South and State Street to be able to call up the social worker at the CCC downtown and say, uh, can we bring someone down to talk with you about available beds for detox, et cetera. And so that's a resource that we I know we intended for the Rio Grande neighborhood, but being in PD will be able to be utilized citywide. And it's a need that is we can't we haven't even begun to articulate how great it is. Hey to jump in we can have more social workers, but there's no more detox beds. They're not funded. If we took the three position funding and we put it to buy two detox we could do uh, they two detox, three detox beds for the entire year for that. Um, we don't have any place to take folks. Uh, if I'm a social worker and I get called by the police to go meet with somebody, I can meet with them. Maybe I can assess them. I don't have a place to put them. I, don't, I, have, no I have no other action. I, as a social worker, I don't take them home. <laughs> I, that's my limit of what I can do. And so I, I, I totally understand if we had housing on the back end and some other resources and we were funding that through the county and other things, um, and our problem was getting people from here to here. I totally agree. I don't think that's our problem, though. So um, I, I think so. it is actually in part. And just this morning, I asked Chief Brown 
uh, about the two beds that the police department funds at detox. They've mm -hmm. got two beds set aside, and what is our utilization rate? So this is me formally asking for feedback from the police department about the utilization rate of the two beds that we're currently funding. And um, off the top of their heads, they didn't feel that they were full all of the time, that they were always being, those two beds were always being utilized. So I think we should, we need more information about what we're already paying for and whether or not that's where we need to make the investment. We don't know. I'm not saying that, but I'm saying that they're not filled for what reasons. It's not just because no one's taken them there. The police have access to 10 beds anytime they want, all day long, every day at detox. They're not empty because you, you people, because we don't have people to take them there. They're empty for a variety of reasons. So that's why I want to be careful about, uh, like I said, I'm not trying to stop resources from going down to Rio Grande. I think we need to do that. I'm just trying to make sure that we're clear about what we're targeting with what money now. So, council members, I see that we have two straw polls. One is to keep the money where it currently lies, which is to fund the social workers in the police department. For clarification, it would just fund those three additional positions, so it wouldn't require all of that funding, and I don't know what that number is for. The, the three positions is 222000 um, and then the, the funding that, la that would lapse from this current year is 380000 so. 380, mm -hmm. so 160,000 difference. Great. <clears throat> um, so I see that as one straw poll, and then capturizing the money. Capturing, thank one. you. I'm just, I'm trying to do like 40 things at once here. Turn in church push. Capturing, you know, it's nuclear, you know. You can do that if you want. Capturing the money and using it for some other purpose, intent that we can discuss to be used around the Rio Grande area. David. Councilman Rogers, I appreciate uh, the opportunity to maybe say a couple of things. Um, so you received an email today uh, from Patrick and I um, after last week's conversation at the council, um, the, the comments made by Council Member Kitchen, the, com the comments made by uh, Council Member Johnson and Mendenhall about sustainable um, solutions uh, to downtown. Um, and this conversation today that one of the biggest gaps that we have um, is that access to services, right? We could, we could have a conversation about Medicaid expansion right here, but we're not going to yet. Um, so based on some of that conversation, um, I have initiated, and these are very preliminary conversations, but I just kind of wanted to throw out there in terms of um, some, some additional thoughts uh, on how we can bring um, uh, sustainable solutions or pilot some sustainable solutions into the Rio Grande area. So I initiated some conversations with Salt Lake County Behavioral Health, very preliminary, um, to begin to talk about how can we address some of the gaps in services. Um, that if Salt Lake City and Salt Lake County together were to provide some funding uh, that would leverage the resources that we're putting into the community through the social worker program and the community connection center, that that becomes a, uh, a central place, if you will, to connect individuals to treatment. The opportunity through there in partnership with the county, we will identify individuals who are already Medicaid eligible, uh, largely because of mental illness, disability, uh, creates eligibility opportunities for Medicaid, which is in, in essence a ticket into, into treatment. And then those that are not Medicaid eligible, the opportunity possibly to set some priorities for treatment, for detox beds, that so that when our social workers are connecting with individuals, having that presence in the community, doing exactly as Council Member Penfold uh, identified in terms of developing that relationship, um, identifying what issues are driving the homelessness, the mental illness, the addiction, but then on the back end being able to then leverage those resources to connect them to actual treatment. Um, so those are conversations that are just beginning. Um, again, because of the council's discussion last week, I thought, wow, what a great opportunity to look for some additional partnership. The other piece that's attractive uh, for the administration in looking at this is, that can accomplish two goals. One, uh, providing immediate relief to the community, to the homeless individuals in the Rio Grande neighborhood, and moves us 
closer towards that, towards that system reform that we're a part of with collective impact. So it's that wraparound services, connecting that case management, the assessment uh, at the community connection center, which will uh, you know, identify housing stability issues, will identify addiction, will identify mental illness. Uh, so preliminary conversations with Salt Lake County, I think very fruitful. Um, I know the behavioral health director uh, personally, and so reached out to him. Um, and, knew that, and, and know that he's creative and innovative. And so I think there's some real opportunity uh, to providing some relief through that kind of partnership. Um. Thank you, David. Appreciate your insight into that. So two straw polls. Number one would be that we continue to fund the three positions of, for social workers, capture the savings of $150,000 to be used elsewhere in the Rio Grande area. That's the first straw poll. The second would be that we don't fund these social workers at all, and that money is, is captured to be used for the entire area in the Rio Grande area. That's as basic as we're going to get, I think, before we start defining other ideas to be used for that money. Could I clarify one thing on the second proposal then? Um, if, if Let's we, do the first one. If we, if, we earmark this, if we earmark the second one towards homeless services, it doesn't mean that we don't use part of it for whatever, we, whatever is identified in there. It could be social work, it could be police, whatever it is. I'm just trying to make sure we're flexible to allow the best practices the folks who are doing it to tell us what would be most effective for that. It's not a lot of money. 380000 doesn't seem to get us very far, but it will give us something immediately. And my concern is delaying that for three months through the summertime. So I'm trying to allocate that now and then figure out the specifics as soon as we can. Okay. That's the intent. First drop poll, fund the three social workers, capture the, the remaining money to be used or allocated for homeless services in the Rio Grande area. Thumbs up. Okay, it's 4-3. Uh, the nays uh, take it with Johnston, Luke, Kitchen, and Adams. And then the second straw poll would be that we don't fund the social workers and that, that capturing that money goes towards homeless services. In Right. <laughs> I mean, to, I just, if I can throw out there that the administration's original recommendation for the budget, um, while it had the placeholder for the vacancy savings of those FTEs, I think they um, approached the budget with the intention that if the savings was sort of eligible other places in the police department, they still have those FTEs authorized. They could still hire them if that became a priority in the department. So putting that amount in the police budget doesn't preclude them from hiring those FTEs. It would just mean that they would have to shuffle their resources around internally in order to make that a priority. Okay. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. yes. Strapple two. Yeah, focused. What was that? Yeah. So the straw poll in this would be that the money would, would be used within the 380,000 we're talking about now. 380, okay. the total amount. Uh, not, to be, not to use that money to funding social workers, but to be used for the Rio Grande homeless services area. Okay. Thumbs up is you're in favor of that. Thumbs down is you're not. Okay. There we go. Seven up. And um, from a, this is going to sound really boring, but from a, from a logistical, boring budget person standpoint, um, maybe for maximum flexibility, is it okay if we locate that in, the, and maybe I should address this to the administration, is it okay if we locate that in the non-departmental budget so that if there's some sort of cross-departmental, like maybe I could see sure. some of the expenses might belong in community and neighborhood, some of the expenses might belong in police, maybe you could come back to the council later in the year to clarify that? Is that is that okay? Absolutely, and our, and our intent would be to engage the council uh, in the conversations. Okay. 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 That really uh, took a real, really weird turn, but let's get back on track <laughs> and go to our unresolved issues, and maybe we can hammer them all out pretty quick. Okay, so I think we've kind of resolved that. Well, I don't. I, I mean. Somewhat. Seems like we've resolved some of the items in item A. Um, unless other council members see uh, some of those items as separate and apart from what's listed in item A. And then item B is somewhat related to that, although I don't know, you know, it's not necessarily intrinsically related to that. So I don't know if you want to talk about that together. Actually, item C, I guess, is partially. 
So, um, as a clarification, there were several ideas, a pilot project, um, some increase in patrol. There were a couple ideas that were sort of floated around uh, impacting that area. We've set aside $380,000 so that we have an opportunity to refine some of those ideas. I think one of the challenges is that we just didn't have good information on a lot of those concepts. Um, is that accurate in your understanding of what we just did, Jennifer? So yeah. I don't know that, I, I guess what I'm asking is, do we, are we comfortable enough with any of these specific dollar amounts to try to approve them now? Or do we want to uh, spend a few weeks researching those since we've allocated the money and come back with very specific dollar amounts? Do you, which dollar amounts are you referring to? Uh, Sorry. I'm saying the pilot project on the Trailer. you know, trailers. The, oh. There were a couple of those items specifically. There was some overtime for the police department for patrol. So there were I'm, some. I didn't hear from the administration's proposal that the 380 was part of the portable restrooms idea, but maybe I'm wrong. If so I'm wondering, well, I'm wondering if it could be, because that's... We, it could be, I guess. We, 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 we said that money would be focused in that area, right. and that's a project that's about focus in that area, I it, think. It so, the so, that's, so that's what I guess I'm asking yeah. for that so clarification. In, I think then we would need more clarification from the council. Um, in my mind, I think one of the challenges is because you've located the money in non-departmental um, without explicit instruction that the administration come back to you for approval, there's nothing requiring them to, and maybe having them come back for approval would be not advantageous to addressing the issue because the issue would be going on in the summer, I would imagine, the main issue. So if you want it to be flexible, that may mean you won't know what, or, or you won't necessarily have an approval process to. So Jennifer, there are some projects that we've actually listed and uh, unfortunately, some of our dollar amounts are just, we're just uncertain about. Uh, the, the San Francisco dollar amount we're very certain about. Okay. Um, but it's a question of is that the model or is there, are there other models to right. look at? And so one of the questions that I raised was that is that the most immediate response or is funding the clean uh, the green team, clean team, actually the clean team to $100,000 more of actually cleaning up some of the situations with that have a greater impact. We don't know, and I'm not, and I'm not sure I'm prepared to have that conversation right now. That's the challenge. Right, and I think that the challenge back to the council uh, <laughs> is that this is the time to allocate the money. So if, I mean, I think the, the conversation can continue, but if the money's not there, it's hard to have the conversation, I guess. Jennifer, you really didn't get us anywhere. I'm with sorry. That speech. <laughs> you I have five hundred eighty thousand dollars. You can spend. Right. I think. I think. We got it. We got it. We got it. I'm ready. We're ready for that. I, 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 I like the uh, the intent is cleanliness, and, and we may we may or may not have more people actually using the restroom if we have more restrooms. Um, we're not sure about that piece, but I like the idea of if the idea is cleanliness, and there's a cheaper way to go about it than just this, the portable trailer. I'm not opposed to the portable trailer, but can we get a lot more cleaning up um, for a, a similar amount of money? So, Mr. Chair, saying, chair, hang on. <laughs> <laughs> we talk about toilets and everyone wants to talk. It's our minute. favorite subject. I agree. Poop. I know exactly where everyone's going with this, so we will start with Lisa. Oh. I can only preface this by saying that I think in my six years it? here, so, yeah, I want to preface so, too. We've always too. The, our our most entertaining and len lengthy budget discussions have always been around toilets, huh. uh, whether the restrooms and bathrooms or, or, or excuse me, restrooms and bathrooms and parks or wherever. But it's been so, consistent. Yeah. So this is what we're going to do. We're going to go with Lisa, then we're going to go to Aaron. It's ladies first, and then we're going to go to Charlie. Okay, so if you want to call me Lisa the Latrine Queen, um, I'm okay with that. Uh, I, I'm really interested in doing this. I am not interested in taking the money that we just said to be used in the Pioneer Park area for these toilets. I think they should be for the safety issues that we've talked about and increasing that and where we can make doing that. Um, I'd like to take it from that 900000 that we had and I would propose 200,000. Yeah. Um, okay. 
and I and and look for a match, uh, not at the same level, but for some kind of match from the community on it. And and I I think we can get a lot more bang for our buck in Salt Lake than you can get from San Francisco. And Charlie's been doing a little research on that, and I think we can do that. But I would propose that we do it as a pilot for a year, and have. Um, multiple stations in here we talked about just one but multiple stations see how far our money will take us to do that and having uh, attendance at, at least one of them 24 hours a day if we can do that um, so I'm, I'm I'm looking to do that as a pilot and see how it goes and see if it makes a, a difference um, if we can Mr. Chair I'll expand on that after Aaron Thanks. But I but I do want to go I do want to go into a little bit more detail on it um, yeah. to what Aaron's or uh, Lisa's talking about. But Aaron, I don't know if he just jumps in and finishes it up, and we'll come back to you. Thanks. Ladies first. <laughs> I don't have a lot to say. I, I agree that money that we just straw pulled, I didn't take for any use in the Rio Grande neighborhood. I like Lisa saw that we were doing that for public safety. And I am open to entertaining other allocations for the cleanliness issues around there. But um, I wanted to clarify that. Are you saying, Andrew, that it, we might get we might get a cleaner sidewalk by allowing people to continue using the sidewalk, but paying people to clean it up instead of paying for a toilet? What I'm saying is that a lot of homeless people I've worked with um, go to toilets to use drugs and use the toilet, and and they're mentally ill or high, they don't go to the toilet. I think, saying, Andrew, not, I can't hear you because of this. I'm, 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 not a, I'm not opposed to more toilets, first up. <laughs> Put that on the record. But I'm saying that having more toilets does not automatically mean that we're going to have fewer refuse on the, on the ground. Um, there's not a, a direct correlation all the time between those. I'm not saying it wouldn't, but uh, if we assume that having twice as many toilets means we have half as much um, waste on the ground, we're going to miss some of the issues down there on Rio Grande, I think. So. I, I'm, I think it's okay that if we have, I'm not endorsing drug use, but I think it's okay that we uh, recognize that toilets are used for more things than going to the bathroom, and that um, that also contributes to quality of life in that neighborhood, whether or not you are watching someone shoot up on the sidewalk or in a stoop or they're in a bathroom, that that's a reality of, of downtown. Um, so I'm, I'm open to this. I'm glad you guys have done some footwork on it. But I wonder if we, if, when we, it's comfortable to approach it as a pilot because then we're saying we're just going to try it out for a time, but that um, I don't think we have baseline to measure success on, you know, do we have a count of feces on the street? I mean, how do we? I think we actually do have a baseline um, because we have the clean team out there. We have a hazmat team that goes out, and, and they know how often they're needing to do it. And if that goes down over the course of the year, we'll know we're making an impact. And as far as um, plus, you'll be able to monitor the usage. Yeah. Of the, so you know of how the what the frequency That's is. That's a better tool. And and they have somebody there checking off every time it gets used because it gets cleaned after so many uses. And I, I like having a place to deposit needles, even if it's being used to shoot up. It's nice to pretend that doesn't happen, but it does happen. And I would rather have needles in a, a deposit safe spot than out on the street. Uh, the last piece, I think, is that we are never not going to have to have a clean team. We are the capital city. They will have to go out every single day. We can put toilets on every single block, and we're still going to have issues on the Absolutely. sidewalks. And so I don't think that that's a realistic measure, but tracking the usage is. And I think it's important that um, if we have an opportunity to track uh, needle disposal, that that mm -hmm. become a measure also of success. It's not just about urine and feces on the sidewalks. It's, right. it, it's about other things, too. So I want to incorporate that if we decide to go ahead with this. Um, Mr. Chair, thank you. Um, so. This concept that um, Lisa and I have been looking into is, is very similar to what San Francisco is doing, but it's not the same thing that San Francisco is doing. Really what, what it would include would be, I mean, the similarity would be that you have um, toilet facilities on a trailer 
that could be moved and relocated. And the second thing is that they're managed. The way that San Francisco, the price of $136,000 per unit is the price that San Francisco is paying. San Francisco has a city employee who is managing that program. I don't think that makes a lot of sense. Um, what I, what my recommendation would be, and I think what Lisa's talked about, is, is, is expanding the green team contract to manage those facilities. Clean the team. clean team. Yeah, and the reason that you, you manage the facilities for a couple of reasons. One, um, portable toilets get messy really quickly. So you need to, in order for them to be used properly um, and humanely, they need to be cleaned. That's something that the um, attendant would be watching for. Uh, the attendant, you wouldn't have them, you know, take names or anything like that. You'd basically just, you know, monitor who's going in, how long they're in there, and if you need to knock on the door, you knock on the door and, and ask them to hurry up. One of the things that, um, that I've heard with portable toilets that are not managed in the city, and even park toilets, is they end up being taken over um, by different individuals and groups for different reasons, whether it's drugs, whether it's um, sex, whether it's you know, any number of things, but they end up being, I mean, they're, they're territorialized from individuals who will manage them for their own, own needs. That's what the attendant would, um, would help resolve. So is it going to end people going to the, the defecating on the streets? Hopefully it will, it, it will help with that. Um, if you're mentally ill and you're you're apt to do that anyway, you're gonna you're gonna continue to do it. But there are a lot of homeless folks who um, who do not have the resources available to um, take care of themselves. And I think that sometimes as a city, it's easy to we we like to think globally, and and I think you know we do a really good job of. How can we get people into how, you know, how could, what's our long-term goal? But while addressing the long-term goal, sometimes we step over, um, literally, uh, some of the, the problems that, that could be resolved um, fairly easily. Um, and this is one of them. Uh, we've heard from uh, the Pioneer Park Coalition, we've heard from the Downtown Alliance that the, pro the, the urine and defecation on the streets is becoming a much bigger problem over the past couple of years. Um, we've heard them ask, for, ask us to do something about it. So the pilot concept is a way to do just that. It's a way to look at it and, and actually measure what kind of a success rate we're having um, and whether or not it's worth continuing. So I recommended the matching component that Lisa brought up because since we've heard from the community, I think it's important that the community also take an active role in this. Um, the 200,000 the 200, and, and I would recommend a $75,000 matching uh, from the community. Um, it would be, the, the, pro, the money would be contingent on receiving that community match because I think we do have to have um, some sort of community involvement in making sure that this, that this is successful. Um, so we, we look at that. That number was arrived at using the San Francisco numbers. But in some of the work that's been done by council staff and others, we found that I, there are vendors who can come up with uh, the actual facility uh, for anywhere from about $5,000 to $15,000, somewhere in there. Um, which means the, the vast majority of this would be, would be going to the staffing and the management of it. Um, I anticipate that that would be far less than what San Francisco is paying their city employee to manage the program. Um, but I think that the, the relationship that we have through it with Advantage uh, is something that they would be, they're already doing a lot of the cleanup through the clean team. Um, this is not something that's foreign to them. They understand how to deal um, with, with this the, with the waste issue, and so that that would be the idea there. Um, if the city purchases 
the, the toilet trailers. We have so many different things that we can use them for if this pilot fails. It's not like, you know, we're going to buy something and get stuck with an asset that if it fails in a year, we're done with it. You could use them for different, you know, different festivals that we have here on site. You could use them for uh, uh, the Twilight concert series. So we're, we'd be ending up purchasing an asset that we can use in other ways if this fails. But in all honesty, the way that, that, that we saw the program working in San Francisco, um, it's a way that we can actually deal with a problem that is impacting not only homeless individuals or people who, who happen to be homeless or are, are suffering right now, but it is also impacting the business owners, it is impacting residents who live down there. Um, and it's a way that I think we can, for a, a amount of, you know, a specific amount of money uh, and a partnership from the community, I think it's worth trying. Um, because really, we're not going to, like I said, we're not, we will not end up with an asset that can't be used elsewhere. Um, the, the, the trailer, I think, what, you know, when we do move this forward, I think we ought to, we ought to look to having uh, a trailer that would have two stalls or two separate units. Um, I think the needle uh, disposal is critical. Um, that is something that, you know, it, it's, it's, it's taking place so at least we can, people can dispose of them properly. Uh, and I also think that we need to include a hand washing station uh, at, these, at these facilities. The San Francisco units did not have that. I think that um, we ought to have that uh, for these if we're really So Charlie, do you have a, a figure? An amount that you're looking yeah, the at. Two, the, so Lisa, Lisa mentioned two hundred thousand um, dollars. I agree. I don't think it should come from the three hundred and eighty thousand dollars that we were using. I think um, we can look at it elsewhere, and then a seventy-five thousand dollar match uh, that would be required to uh, access that two hundred thousand to move forward with the with Mr. the program. Chair. Yes, um, Lisa, what is that two seventy-five based on? Where did you get that number? I made it up. No, I. Um, Based on knowing we want to have round the clock at at least one, possibly two, and do it on the weekends, not just Monday through Friday. And I haven't run the numbers on what it costs for personnel, um, but I know it's a lot less than in San Francisco. Okay. And what about equipment? And the equipment, we have looked at a couple things, and it, I don't want to quote it because we probably want to look at several, but we've dramatically less. Like, what would you say? Yeah, and, I, and that's where I mentioned it. Anywhere from about five to fifteen thousand dollars per unit, depending on what we want to have installed on us. Cindy has but some information on that. I'm wondering too if we already have the. Do we have the capability of dumping those kind of portable toilets today? Does if Vicki Bennett were sitting here, would she say, "Oh yeah, we can work equipped to do that tomorrow, at no additional cost for"? the staff that it takes to dump it. It's not the same staff people you employ to, to run it. That is a, that's a great question and something we've got to figure out. And that, and that would be something that, you know, in, in San Francisco, I, I think the other thing that's different than San Francisco is San Francisco only has these open, I think, at eight hours at a time, um, which is ridiculous to me, you know, as if people only needed to go to the restroom, you know, during an eight-hour period. Um, you know, I don't think we need to have all of them open 24 hours a day, but I think we need to have some. Um, the, the good thing is that they're portable, and what, what San Francisco does is does a thorough cleaning nightly. Um, so even if you have something open 24 hours a day, uh, you can switch it out easily with, with something that has been uh, cleaned. And it's probably something that we would, we would talk to whichever vendor we were working with to figure out, you know, what the disposal um, rate is or if the if we have the ability to do that as a city. My guess is we don't. I think, we you know, we'd probably want to contract that out. And I, if I could just add, the, the typical process of this wouldn't be, I mean, we, we talk in the Royal We about we, our contract and things like yeah. that, but it's actually the administration would issue, an, would have to legally issue an RFP 
vendors would respond to that RFP based on either the amount of the budget available or the criteria. It sounds like there's some criteria that you'd want to put in. Um, maybe we could put it in a legislative intent to make sure that that was included in the RFP, like the hours of operation and the needle disposal thing and the staffing thing. Um, and then what I would imagine is that based on whatever the vendors responded with, that's when a follow-up conversation could be had. So for example, if a vendor came back and you could get six units with that budget and that price, um, great. If a vendor came back, if three vendors came back and the best option was only one unit, maybe that results in a follow-up council conversation with the actual RFP information at hand. Does that make sense? Jennifer, uh, clarification, if we want to accelerate this process, <coughs> is it possible to expand the contract of an existing contractor like the um, clean team people and do it that way. I can understand an RFP process for equipment. I'm just wondering if we're putting, you know, following the RFP procedure, we're probably putting this out two, three months. Agreed. I think um, I would question if the clean team people have, the, like, are, are they, would they be your staff people for the portable potties? And yeah. who would dispose of the? Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Um, but maybe we could get, uh, is it possible to go to them for a proposal uh, about this without going to an RFP process? Or so Cindy has some information too. Just maybe what we could do is ask, I think we have your policy concepts, um, pretty sure, but I know there are others that, that want to speak. And then what we could do is um, work with the administration in the next uh, few days to come up with a draft motion for you. And um, the, when people are referring to costs that they have gathered, we, everybody's been giving that information to Allison. And Allison has um, a couple of charts started, but all the information is coming so quickly, she doesn't have anything to hand out today. So uh, it seems like the resources are many. Um, Jennifer had mentioned to me the San Francisco group uses a nonprofit. Uh, for the staffing and that type of a thing. So um, I, I don't know if you'd be willing to go with concepts and then let us come back with a draft motion uh, maximizing the um, opportunity to have this resource available, dealing with the public health issue, um, all these things you've said. <laughs> Mr. Chair. Uh, um at the risk of being premature here. I, I, I'm prepared to suggest we do a straw poll to allocate $200,000 to a pilot project for um, a follow-up motion uh, containing the information that Cindy referenced. I do believe the staff has been very engaged in this process, so I'm really comfortable with them developing a process that would include a $75,000 match, and uh, we can figure out the logistics of how to get there after we've allocated the money. Okay, uh, that's your straw poll, right, Stan? Does everybody, uh, just, yeah. does sure everybody else okay. understand where we're going with that? Okay. And that the money is not to come out of the previously yeah. identified. Out of that $484,406. Yeah, $486. yeah. out of that. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. yeah. right, out of that, but not. Yeah. Can we do a little bit more discussion before sure. we do that? I, I feel like this is a really interesting idea and um, we should pursue it in some way, but this is not a representation of this council's priorities, and we are jumping to spend almost a quarter of a million dollars on this idea that bubbled up a week ago. I think it's a good idea, but this, when we, we're gonna get down to bickering over 10,000 bucks, I guarantee it, we do it every year, and we are jumping to spend 200,000 bucks on something we just came up with. That didn't come out of a process from anything it came out of a trip and it and it was a good it's a good idea but i'm just saying i don't like how hastily we're going about this i don't know that 24 hour a day is good because the shelter's open for and the shelter will allow people to come in and use restrooms and the idea of having a reason for people to amass on a sidewalk at two o'clock in the morning and having to have an employee out there that we're liable for um, I'm not sure that's a good idea. So I just feel this is really hastily put together and it's not representative of our, our priorities. So I'm not Homelessness is a priority. Homelessness is a priority and this is absolutely This is not that. resolving homelessness. This nope, is about the quality nothing. of life in the Rio Grande area, which is important. 
I'm not saying it's not important, but, but this is hastily done. So before we go back and forth, I'm comfortable moving forward with the straw poll. Aaron, I really appreciate your comments. I'm with you there. I think it's a little bit, a little bit quick, but um, yeah, this it does it, it, it does handle a problem with economic development down in the area if it's used properly. And that's the whole point is if it's implemented properly, I think it could be a success. It all depends on how it's implemented. I think it would have been really fun if we would have said, hey, Pioneer Park Coalition or, you know, Homicide Evaluation Commission, we're going to put $200,000 towards your best idea to help the homeless situation in this budget. Go. Give us some ideas. You've got 10 days or whatever we've spent on this discussion a week. Give us some ideas. Give us some feedback. Sure, let's spend Mr. 200 grand on the homeless issue, but we just cooked this up right here without well, consulting all of the process that we have going on. But we've also heard from the Pioneer Park Coalition, from the Downtown Alliance, that this is a real issue. I, I know it is a real issue, no, but, we've, this but we've heard from that. Solution didn't we've heard come from, from the process no. that we have. All solutions don't necessarily come from a specific process, and that's the problem with the process. At large, just saying that since some, if there's a good idea because it didn't go through or because it didn't come from a particular group, so we're going to discount it or we're not going to move forward with it, even though it does address and potentially resolve an issue that we hear from many different community groups about, then that would be irresponsible of us as well. Mr. So. Chair. Uh, yes, Derek. Can I ask a question to the administration? Uh, do you have a position on these portable toilets? Uh, <laughs> is there something that you would like to say on this? Unfortunately, I was not able to go um, on the trip, and so I'm hearing a lot. We're hearing a lot about this based on the feedback. Um, if this is a, a council priority, we can implement it in a way that will make it successful. Um, I think this. I think the underlying issue is something that we're very attentive to and is an important issue to address. And if this helps us address that, I uh, thank you. Obviously, we um, support that um, and we'll work with the council to make sure it's implemented uh, effectively. I'm just wondering, you know, I have this draft of potential improvements to the Rio Grande area. One of them is not this portable toilet. And I'm wondering if that would be comfortable, if you'd um, be comfortable adding that to this list. Where I would say it's consistent is we've done the Portland lose. So right now we have the Portland Luz, um, and and the uh, <clears throat> the San Francisco concept is very consistent with what we did with Portland Luz. Council Member Luke uh, identified some of the concerns that we're experiencing with the Portland Luz as they are not monitored, so they do um, get uh, taken over, um, and so. Putting the Portland Lose in the neighborhood was an attempt to address this issue, and I would say that this is a continuation of that conversation. How did the, uh, how are the Portland Lues working? When they're used the, the right way, they're very effective, um, but it, it becomes an issue of the monitoring. Um, and right now we're seeing and experiencing a situation downtown where, um, unfortunately, um, it gets engaged in the drug trade and drug dealers uh, take control mm -hmm. um, and block access. Um, and so I think this addresses some of those concerns. Mm -hmm. But it, in terms of a facility, they are effective. Would it be useful for us to use some of this funding for monitoring the Portland Lose instead? How long does it take to shoot up compared to use the bathroom? That's the issue. Because one of those Portland Loos is a shooting gallery and the other one is the bathroom. And apparently everyone down there knows which is which. And the drug dealers control the ones that's a shooting gallery and they let you in and you do that and they come out. And if the difference is a matter of 30 seconds or two minutes, nobody's going to know the difference. So we can pay someone to monitor it, but they're still going to go in there and use it for the same purposes. Mr. Chair. Yes. Um, if I could also just say that, you know, the Port and Lou uh, did come out of a uh, multi-year uh, project uh, that we looked at in a process and are a heck of a lot more expensive than what we're talking about here and are rife with problems. So, you know, again, that's a perfect example of sometimes where the process doesn't work and sometimes, you know, we, it's worth trying something new. I just wanted to ask that question, but I, you know, I am supportive of this idea, Charlie and Lisa, and I think, you know, I understand where 
Aaron's concern is coming from. Um, but, you know, I think that this addresses a number of issues from, you know, public health. Um, I think that this is also a huge asset that the city will be uh, getting that can be redeployed if it's not as successful as we think it will be. I do think it will be a big success, though. Um, I think we maybe should look at getting proposals for knowing exactly how much we need to, how long it would need to be monitored. Like, is 24 hours realistic or not? Um, so I'd be interested to know a little bit more specifics on that. Um, but if I can, just for a second, talk about the 380,000 uh, that we've got. I'm wondering if we can have a discussion about where our intent is to spend that a little bit more specifically. Is that something you guys would like to have right now? or I, I think that's the whole plan, but we've got to get past this issue before we start talking about another one. Um, so at, at this point in time, um, there was a straw poll suggested, and I want to make sure that I word this right so everybody feels like we're on equal playing fields. The proposal was $200,000 towards the trailers with a matching of $75,000. Is that correct? The money was not to be taken from the social worker aspect of it, but to be used from the, the remaining amount. So, council members, we're going to do a straw poll here. If you're in favor of that 200000 with a 75000 match for the trailers, uh, the trailer bathrooms, and whatever we can get out of that amount of money. So, thumbs up, you're in favor. Thumbs down, that you want to move on uh, with the money. So, here we go. Thumbs up, you're in favor. Thumbs down. Okay, that's five up, two down. The two were uh, Mendenhall and Penfold. I would like to. Um, I'd like to have some follow-up when we get some prices in place about the reality of those funds. I don't want to wait until next year if there's any excess uh, from our allocation. If we've over-allocated, we, totally we can make that a part of the contingent appropriation. That a report back after the RFP is issued. Is that Please. sort of how it would? I think that we'll be getting a lot of information from different people as we have been in the past few hours and um, I think a lot of it is so administrative that we can we'll get you information before next Tuesday and after next Tuesday you can put in a, re a report requirement in a month or whatever maybe and maybe was I hearing too that you wanted to follow up when the contract is issued so like when they actually receive information from vendors responding to the RFP and if maybe not all the 275 is needed for what they're responding with is that what you're saying it doesn't seem like we would be able to react that quickly with reappropriating the money um, that we're not we I don't know that we're gonna have a budget amendment come up so quickly that Perhaps we will. Who knows? So we could say September or something. Mm -hmm. Some, some, or, relatively or when, soon. When the contract is executed, even okay. when we've okay. got a, a number, a usable number, okay. that would be a good time. Mm -hmm. Mr. Chair. Yes. Could I ask if we want to put an intent on this two hundred thousand with the match that it, the intent is to deal with sanitation and um, toilets, right? But it may include some way to help mitigate the Portland Loos. Is that possible as well? I don't want to, as the council say, it's only to buy a trailer. It's to say we're trying to get to a problem. I'd like to hear if that can be a part of the solution with some other things as well. So, um, from the administration, we're absolutely uh, interested in exploring the opportunities and, and the possibilities. The rest of the council is in favor of that as well. Yeah. I just don't want to get bogged down in saying it's just by a trailer and some people to monitor it. I want to see if we're dealing with the problem itself. We were going to offer Council Member Luke a job. Um, <laughs> All right. By the Portland News. Thank you. We've got to move on from this because we're way behind. Jennifer, let's move on. So um, I heard two things. One is to revisit the 380 that the council decided on, not revisit, but um, clarify intent, or um, the council could go forward and allocate the remaining. There's 384,000 remaining in the um, general fund budget as a be, be, surplus. Yeah. So you could go through the rest of the unresolved issues and then come back to the 380 if you want. Let's do that. Okay. Um, because so we're talking about money and look where it's gotten us. We are talking about Nowhere. money. Nowhere. <laughs> 
Um, so the next item is funding for the green team, um, which no official straw poll was taken. There was some more information that was provided. Um, since that discussion was held, some council members have indicated an interest in revisiting the clean team um, allocation amount too. So those are two different things, um, and I don't know which whichever the council wants to discuss. So let's, uh, let's discuss the, the clean team first, and then we'll go to the green team. Okay. Because maybe the funding will come from the green team for those council members that wanted to discuss the clean team. So who was in favor of, of looking at the funding for clean team again? I think Stan. Clean, not green, clean. So my comment was related to additional resources to clean up some of the human waste that we're experiencing downtown, but that may be sufficiently covered in our okay. intent with the last the motion. So. Great. Well, I, I would like to see us fund even more clean team. Me too. And I would I propose taking it from the funding of the green team in order to Well, right happen. now there's no funding for the green team. So the 125 is not in the budget. You'd have to add it's, that. It hasn't been because it's not in blue, right? Uh, right, it would, it, yeah, it would have to be added to the mayor's recommended budget in order to be funded. The RDA funded a startup cost, but there's no funding for the operation costs. So this is a pretty, pretty critical program, and the intent when the RDA did the startup cost was that we would look for resources to actually employ people to do that, and that's what this money does, is it actually employs people in a job, job training model to to grow food in the location where we spend a lot of money from the RDA to prepare the uh, lots for growing food. My understanding was that this 125 is for the staff. Is that right? That's what I understood it to be used as for as well, staff. Eight or nine individuals. Yes, eight or nine. I and I, I don't remember I like this project, but I feel surprised by this amount of money. When we looked at it with the RDA, I did not have any understanding that we were going to, that it was not going to happen unless now we also appropriated $125,000. I understood as an RDA board member that when we funded it through the RDA, it was off and running. Nope. And um, that would have been a really different discussion mm -hmm. if they would have said, actually, we're going to ask for, <laughs> yeah, right. it's going to be 200 altogether. So I feel slighted by this. And well, in terms of asking the private community to match our toilets, the private community, if I remember back to when the RDA did that funding, was being asked to fund this portion. And they're not there. And I think the way that the staff clarified it last week was that the 125 <clears throat> would be the city's portion and that the remaining 125 would essentially be 125 from the city and then 125 from other sources that haven't been raised yet. But they might have been counting the RD, RDA 75. They were. That's they were uh, separate from the RDA. Is it no, yeah. She I, sat before us, and yes. I swear it wasn't a 50-50. It was no. the, the RDA was 56000 In addition to the 56000 125 would come. So you're right. It's the city and RDA combined is more than 50% of the total budget. And this will be the value in having more... Uh, more robust RDA budget discussions in the future on things like this so that you can look at it from both sides at once. That'll help. I think it's also reflective, though, of the, the business community, the private investor community not stepping up on this project. And that's what was communicated to me in the meeting I had about this, that they were approaching the business community to help fund the program, and they haven't funded enough of the program, in my opinion. So. Anyway, I, I like the program. I just feel surprised by, by yeah, this I, request. I agree. There should be more. Um, there should be more opportunities for this. Uh, so I guess council members, we're going to do a straw poll. If you would like to use 125,000. Uh, if you're in favor of trying to figure out the funding source, the running total. Of this. The the running the running total is just that green at the top 384. Okay. If you're in for, for funding the project, show us a thumbs up. And if you want to have more information uh, moving forward, have them better outreach with the public and, and partnerships, then uh, you're going to put a thumbs down. So if you want to fund it, thumbs up, thumbs down, you don't want to fund it. One, two. <laughs> <laughs> we'll wait 
on two. It is three down, two up. There's four down. Five down. Okay. You can take that one off and resolve issues. Okay. Well, um, I, I would be... So I would be open to having them come back if they are going to go for a match, uh, a modified version of this. I don't think there's any doubt that any of us would do that. So just for the clear, we're not turning down the old, we're turning it down in this form. But, but if if they're willing to come back with a with a match with the private funds, perhaps it'd be helpful. We can communicate that to uh, them and then the administration as well. And to be clear, it pretty much kills the project for this year since it's a growing project and we've already paid through the RDA for the infrastructure that's ready to go next week essentially but it does but it's ready for this growing season so I'll donate some seeds. So the, the next item is um, Sunday parking enforcement and again that was discussed a little bit last week but no straw poll um, oh the straw poll did not reveal a majority of the council supporting either removing or retaining this item. So do you, do you remember what the straw poll was? It was three to two. No, but I mean what was the exact straw poll? Um, do you want to remove the proposal to enforce to have this additional enforcement on Sundays, what it means is that you would sacrifice 68,000 in revenue. So you would take your running total and reduce it by 68,000. But what uh, also I think Lisa and Mary Beth told us is that um, currently on Sundays, it is call only complaints that they go out and, and right. do. Okay. Right, and this would en enhance that is our understanding it, now. It would still be it would still be called still be complaint complaint based, based, yes. complaint based so it doesn't change that at all. It's right. just who's available more, to go out and deal with it. those complaints. Yeah, I don't understand how there's no expense associated with that. We we <laughs> we tried really hard. Uh, it was getting a detail on exactly what was related to this specific item. It was hard to break that out from the overall compliance budget. So okay, well let's do a straw poll then and see if we have a prevailing side. Those that want to do more enforcement on Sundays, correct? Or those that would prefer to keep it as complaint only? Well, isn't, isn't the question, the administration's already proposed that, we're... And the administration's already proposed it, so by concurring with it, you would just, nothing would change. Right. If you want to remove it, then... You the vote yes to remove it. Yes to remove the administration's proposal, no to go with the administration's proposal. Is that right? Yes to go with the administration's proposal, no <laughs> to not go with it. Okay. So. Um, so if you want to go with the administration's proposal, it's a thumbs up that you want to enforce more on Sunday. If you don't want to enforce more on Sunday and keep it as a status quo, you're going to do a thumbs down. Ready? Let's vote. We've got two up, which is Johnston and Kitchen, and the rest are down. Okay. Wait, those were the two last week, too. There we go. Strange. So we'll Consistent. remove that revenue from the budget. Um, the next item is really just a placeholder since it has come up recently. Um, just the funding, for, ongoing funding for CIP. The current level of funding is less than 7%. It's also a reduction from uh, last year's funding. D just to clarify, the ongoing funding to CIP. So clearly with the one-time state sources uh, for CIP, Overall, CIP investment is going up, but next year that investment will go down because those state revenue sources will no longer be available. So if the council wanted to sort of maintain that level at 7%, um, it would require adding 361000 to the budget. Um, if you wanted to go up to 8%, it would be $2.7 So just, you know, for fun, those figures, having them out there. Um, so that, that's kind of a running list we have. And you have 316000 I would propose, Mr. Chair, that we leave that as is in the mayor's budget. Okay. But we might want to straw poll that. Uh, we will straw poll it. Those leave CIP favor, as is? Yes, I'm just trying to look at that, if there's a negative in front of it, but it's not. So those that are in favor of keeping the, the mayor's proposed budget as is with that? <sighs> Can I, I wanted to say something. What if we get to the end of our list of, of others and we've got some revenue? Can we revisit this? Can we, okay. Just drop it to see, that would be my suggestion is drop it to CIP. So okay. that I, is actually the end of your list of other stuff. I've got Unless there's other, other things. things. So. so do I. Okay, I didn't vote.
James, can you say what the number is? Because I can't see it through Jennifer's head, which is her fault. Okay. Oh, the, oh, the big one on top. Yeah. Okay. Green. So if we vote for that, that three hundred and sixteen thousand goes into CIP. No, no, no. So what is the mayor's proposal? That's that's what I was asking. Yeah. Sorry. The mayor is not proposing anything, anything. with regard to this three hundred and sixteen. This is the three hundred and sixteen that you guys could choose to do whatever you want with. So one of the options is increase the funding to CIP. Yeah, so okay. here's my proposal is that we not at this point make any changes to our the mayor CIP recommendation, but once we discuss a couple other okay. proposals, we may <laughs> drop whatever our balance is to CIP. CIP. But right. my guess is that balance is going to be gone. Okay. So thank you. Great, Darren. Um, last year, we for the first time in about a decade funded enough money for trees to replace at least as many as we tore out. The, uh, the proposal from the mayor's administration this year doesn't do that and would take us back into a deficit of trees. It's only about $75,000 that I request for us to, to do here and it would be a placeholder until um, we can get back, hear back from our urban forester. But to, that should get us to at least breaking even so that we aren't taking out more trees than we're planting next year. That's based on what we allocated last year and uh, the deficit basically. It's based on what, sorry, 75,000 is what they cut this year, 62,000 is what we added this year. So I think if you wanted to get back to that level, you would add those two figures. So 75. So right. we would be up to right. 147, 137. Then that's what I'm asking for. Let me just clarify what are you that real quick. Again, enough money to which replace enough trees, which is either 137 or 147. 137. So 137. Last year, the council funded 222,000 for this. This year, it's being proposed 147,000. So if you wanted to restore the level of funding to what you had the last year, it would be 75,000. Does that make what sense? That's what the council added last year to bring it up to the 222. Okay, great. Seventy-five. So <laughs> Back to the first one. All right. And Strong. if we wanted to do more, then there's more trees. Why than don't we make a pitch right now? No, let, let's not come back to it, because like Stan always says, the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago. The next best time is right now. So, well, I'm. We'll straw pull your 75. Okay. Okay, those who are in favor, unless there's any more discussion you want us to be made, to go back to funding the full amount that we did last year of 225? $222,000. $222, we need 75 to reach that amount, so let's do a thumbs up, thumbs down. Okay, you got your funding here. Yes. Did you hear the Lorax just now? <laughs> He's outside. Okay, Lisa. Yeah. Do you want me to do it? Um, one of the proposals that we've had uh, for about three years that is this close to getting complete funding is the Sega Lily project in um, Sugar House Park. And I would propose um, a $200,000 uh, line item for that. Uh, to be leveraged with a match from the community for the remainder of the balance, which I believe is a $600,000 total. So it would be one-third of what's remaining to actually get that project constructed. There are some time constraints because some of that money is county money for flood control, and so they have feeling some urgency to spend that money pretty quickly. Uh, but we have some pretty significant interest in the arts community. I see this very much like the project we did for the trail over uh, the railroad tracks at, uh, at the um, Jordan River in that we, we found little bits of money along the road and um, were able to incentivize just enough to get that final push from some other funding sources, and I think that's a real possibility here. And Mr. So, Chair, I, I might add that last year we had allocated 750000 for it, and then it turned out we didn't have as much money as we thought, so we had to Scale pull it back. back. Yeah. And, and they're eager to go forward with it, so 
Yeah. And would this be contingent on the match, or would it just be? I would say it'd be contingent, contingent on a match. Yeah, I think I and see it as a challenge. The match, or uh, I believe the total balance. Jennifer will have to confirm this is six hundred thousand dollars. So it would be two hundred thousand uh, dollars with a community match of four hundred thousand. Um, and given the time urgency, sorry, more logistical stuff, is it? Um, okay to include as part of the straw poll that this would be approved outside of the CIP process, even though this would probably be a CIP project eventually, it would be created in that accounting um, world. Um, if we transferred it to CIP, it wouldn't be really approved by the council until September. So is that okay? To I, would, I would say that we yeah. approve it now. Okay. Yeah. Yep, exactly. Thanks. Okay, and before we go to a straw poll on that, um, another one that's come up too that we've heard a lot about from the community is the 600 north slowing down the traffic, the, ca the traffic calming there on 600 north, which is I think 180, 189 or 180 thousand um, dollars, and we we've, we've discussed this. I mean, it's it's a it's a problem over on the west side when people are coming and you've got six north, third north, and north temple really to get there in district one. It's a two people have already died, kids are. You know, it's scary to try and cross the street there. So I look at that as, as a project that wasn't funded, that was recommended by the CDCIP board, um, that I think the council can do a lot of good by funding that, especially for the community. Um, so that's, and James, just a uh, clarification that that's in, it was a CIP application, but it did not come through the mayor's recommendation for CIP. No, is that correct? It did not. So I know that that is. That's more than you have currently. Currently. Two, between the 200,000 and the 189,000. Can, can we, I'm sorry. We're kind of mixed up on the Seiko Lily because there was another appropriation in budget amendment two. Mm -hmm. Is that right? That's right. Okay, so is it your expectation that they would still be meeting that original match? Because I yeah, think they I think there's a, I think there's a previous match too, and I would my expectation would be to combine those so that we would not eliminate the previous match either. But it so didn't even the previous allocation is my my understanding. Like, who would correct me, please, if I'm wrong? Even the previous allocation did not get us to full funding. I believe it did at least that was the expectation at the time that it was of the remaining amount that there would be a portion met by the but city that was and the remit. seven but that was a seven hundred and fifty thousand dollar allocation and then we changed that to five hundred thousand dollars right and you also changed the match requirements so that the balance was met with the match uh, i mean said, I, I just i and what was budget amendment number two, two though number two yeah and so, so that's where we last year. Yeah, and we started out with a larger allocation and then we dropped it by 250,000. Right. And okay. you increased the match amount. Is that right? Right. That's the match requirement. And I yeah. I just need time to go back through our paperwork cuz that one had a lot of iterations. But I'm 75% sure that what the council chose at the time was to decrease the city portion that would be contributed and increase the match portion that would be So and I'm proposing that we bring that city portion back up so it would reduce the match requirement. We're already, okay. uh, I think my understanding it was more than a dollar per dollar match. It was a. Yes, I believe yeah. so. Okay, just wanted to fill in that bit of history and also make sure that's the direction. Um, and I'm wondering, James, and I don't, I have not looked at the CIP, but I wonder if there are other opportunities in the CIP for the 180,000. Ben, ben did clarify that it's not 180,000, it's 80,000. It's 80,000? Yes, mm -hmm. for that We're project. So I, the Six uh, North project. And this is the mm -hmm. end, this is the end of our unresolved issues. Yes. Here's my proposal. I propose that we do $200,000 for the Sega Lily, that we do $41,234 for the Six North project, and we fund the balance out of fund balance for that Six North project. We might so we'll need to actually, clarify the six, I'm sorry. We'll tap into our fund balance a little bit, but we're still well above our percentages if we do that. So I do understand that uh, money from the Transportation Department was made available. I think it's 130000 something like that. Oh, I guess Mary Beth knows right um, now. Apparently, Robin um, 
in transportation uh, has 20 um, that would come from existing transportation sources, has 20,000 that would come from existing transportation sources. So, and she says it's only 75,000 total, although the CIP log says 80. Yeah, there's three things going on here. One is the uh, match for the flashing, or the, I mean, sorry, the funding, internal funding for the flashing lights. So that one's covered. Then the other thing is for the bulb outs, which is the either 70 or 80, depending on what. But that only includes but two bulb outs. It doesn't yeah, include so the, that's the, the third four problem. Total. So mm -hmm. the, the community really wants the four bulb outs. It makes a bigger difference when you're approaching. Yeah, so you need to have that in order to really slow down the, the traffic there. Maybe um, we could specify, it. we could put in 80, well, from whatever funding sources, right. and then ask um, transportation to follow up and ask if the 80 would accomplish four bulb outs. Okay. And if not, then we figure out uh, the rest of the funding. So, sources. clarification, we're doing $200,000 to the Sega Lily that should adjust the requirement for this uh, community match. $41,234 um, to sixth, and then the difference between that and 80000 which is, what, 39000 something. Or whatever um, the difference is to get the four bulb outs. I think that's the wording we need to say. So the $38,766 out of fund balance. And that will take us to a zero, okay. a balanced budget. Now, the, the, there's been a straw poll by Councilmember Penfold. I am full of support with that. Great thinking, Stan. Um, is there any discussion on that before we straw poll it? Okay, so straw poll, you're in favor of that uh, by the uh, motion by Stan. Looks like we are seven up. Okay. So Lisa, are they gonna raise the money? They're, re they're really, they, they just got a $200,000 commitment and um, there's a foundation that will probably come forward, I think, with That's a big exciting. chunk of it. Can we make That's it? Great. Can we make add one contingency on it that we never talk about this again? Which part? The Sega Lily. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, <laughs> there isn't one in Portland. Um, the other, sorry, I don't want to rain. I'm afraid. <laughs> Should I rain? Um, so general fund unresolved issues is, um, is done then with that um, straw poll, which is, that's okay. The only other items that we have related to other funds, so um, the golf fund structural deficit, still there. So um, I think um, the uh, administrative staff is here to talk about it if you want to talk about it, um, or uh, what we've drafted is a legislative intent to request a mid-year briefing um, when actual revenues and rounds um, have started coming in. Um, and then at that point, the council can revisit if there needs to be some significant adjustments in the revenue picture. Obviously, at that point in the year, it makes it a little bit more difficult to make adjustments. Um, so just know that. How um, about with, uh, in regards to golf, when it comes to projections, we, lose, we use last year's actual numbers and not numbers that we're projecting we would like to see? Well, they don't. They what? Uh, they're, they're using projections, right. not last but year's actual. I mean, it just seems like this is the third year now that they are. They always come back completely high. The, the projections do. They're never actually the rounds that have been played, or even close to it. So you're asking that for future years, the rounds projected for the coming year are the same as the rounds that had been played the pre previous year. So Correct. there okay. is no. So for the fiscal year 2018, it's, it's an actual. Right. Yeah. Got it. So, so as I recall the chart, the, there was a steady decline in rounds played except for next year's projected, which mm -hmm. was the only time in the last 10 years, I believe that chart was where we actually projected an increase. Um, and it's a projected increase, not actual. And that's based on the app, right? The utilization the, of the new app. Demand-based pricing. Thank you. It reminds and me of. And the hope of good weather. And it reminds me of our of our parking projections that were never right. James, I like that idea. Good. Do we need to straw poll that or no? We can just prepare legislative, legislative intent, intent for that. Okay. Yep. All right. So, at what point do we come back and talk about it then? We can 
talk about it now. Are we waiting, are we waiting for the projections to come back? We're talking about next year and their projections just going forward. So, I, you know, I, I feel like we need to have a briefing, really, that comes up later on, not right now during the budget, but actually to talk about the real issue. And whether that's sometime in August, September, October, sometime during the year. Just so you know, staff had a little bit of a difficulty um, because so many things are – because the revenue – picture is so um, contingent upon a new idea that it's hard to know if the projections are realistic or not realistic, and I think no one knows until they sort of play out. Um, and so it felt a little hard to say that the projections are wrong because, you know, they could very well be right. Um, but I think we won't know that until later in the year. There is, even with the projections, there is an operational deficit, so I just want that to be clear. Um, That's what I'm getting at, is yeah. that even with the any optimistic projections, it's still a deficit. Well, yeah. We're still looking at a deficit, regardless of <clears throat> um, that's with good weather and, and things playing out well. And, and a partial year payment for the ESCO debt service, which in fiscal year 18 will increase, and then will increase that deficit. So to me, just what, I just want it to be you know, clear that uh, the, the issue will just be dealt with later. Erin. Hi. Andrew. Welcome. Um, do we have a, a time frame then? The time frame would be, in my opinion, I, I would think probably October or November when people aren't golfing so we can actually get some some true numbers. I'd be interested in looking a little sooner. Uh, not the full thing, but I think we need to look at our, our revenue projections in the next two to three months. Um, with the weather being this way, we need to see some forecasts. Um, we'll not wait until the end of the full year, I think. Uh, we need to, I'd rather have more information than less. Even if we just have information in three months that says we're on track, slightly under, slightly over, whatever it is, um, staff's going to need some time to start crunching stuff. And we're going to need some time to talk about the, all the implications. Um, so I'd like to see some revenue sooner than October, end of the season. So, Andrew, we could do just a briefing. Staff doesn't have to do a report on that. We could do a briefing in August or September on all of that to see what we're at. And additionally, we also heard from um, the administration that their process of or inquiry around uh, wing point may have some feedback by late summertime. So I'd like to include that if if there's any information yet around wing point and then also an update on the greens that uh, the council f narrowly funded um, and the status of those greens at that point. Is that yeah. We'll just add that to the legislative intent. So is that it? We'll prepare. The way we typically do this is um, that we group all of those decisions into one, you know, motion that references the key changes document that has all of those decisions reflected in it. So if there's anything you want as a council member to be specifically pulled out so that you can vote on it differently or, you know, make clear for the record what your vote is, let staff know so that we can prepare the motion sheet for next week because next week will be the official budget adoption. Does that make sense? Great. Yes, it does. So um, before we, I want to move on, and if we have time, we'll come back to talk about the, the remaining money, with the lists, and talk about the money, the three hundred eighty thousand. Oh. Okay. So if um, we have time, and then and if not, we'll hear from the administration when they come back with some proposals in regards to that, in the next couple okay. of days. Okay, and we could do it next week too. Although, um, just wanting to make sure all the council members are here, which they won't be next week. So. Oh. Aaron's gone. Oh, yeah, you're going to be at Harvard. Congrats. Thanks. Mm -hmm. I'm excited, but I'm sorry I'll miss that meeting. It'll be important. I'll call in if... Um, if it's an issue? Yeah. Okay. I'd, I'm happy to do that. Okay. Thanks. Cindy. Uh, just to the extent that we have loose ends going after we leave here tonight, after the public hearing, we are at risk of really goofing things up. So... <laughs> Uh, anything that the council can do um, after the public hearing to give us your feedback 
um, even even if you don't um, know if the other council members would support it, if you could share that with us so that we can incorporate it into uh, what we send out in the packets, that increases the odds that we will successfully get the budget adopted and not accidentally do something that um, causes the city to crash in. <laughs> Cindy, yeah. is there, are there specifics that you need um, some input on or? Well, uh, if, if, if there's someone, say, for example, that has an idea about how to spend the 300 and something, but they would also like to pull additional money from somewhere else that you've decided today, um, if, if you could disclose that to us so we could at least get a motion written up for you and then um, double check, say, for example, with the finance people or with the attorney's office in case there are any of those loose ends that need to be figured out. Because uh, on, on whenever we're adopting the budget um, and we're doing that staff work for you guys, the, it's really not possible to wrap up loose ends on that same night. It, it really needs to be... Uh, pretty well disclosed amongst you so that there can be the um, the transparency and also the due diligence um, otherwise we could end up back here like on a Sunday or something <laughs> fixing our mistakes <laughs> so and for clarification purposes I mean our intent is if we have time tonight we'll come back and have a, a more a little more conversation around this three hundred eighty thousand dollars that we've set aside but We've allocated that to non-departmental, so it's there. It's in the budget, mm -hmm. and that and that if we don't resolve that priority spending today, that doesn't jeopardize adoption of the budget. Correct. No, but I think it, to, I know, me, I, to me, the wording about how you allocate that money would determine if it's successful in being deployed right. this summer. Got so it. if the money was contingent upon the council reviewing it and approving its use, that wouldn't happen until mid-July, which would delay right. the actual usage of that money. So to me, that's sort of the key piece. Okay. So what out. Cindy's saying is after the public hearing tonight, make your request known. Yeah. So that we do not get bogged down and we get fouled up next Tuesday. This is us nagging. Thank you. So Thank you with, the 300, with the three hundred eighty thousand dollars, we may not have that tonight, though. Okay. So um, it, spending it promptly, mm -hmm. making it available to the administration promptly, mm -hmm. um, would re would necessitate figuring out something unless you want to come back in July and have things not deployed until August. Or I guess unless the you just want to delegate yeah, to the I was administration. Say the alternative is that the council is really general and trusts the administration will deploy it however they see fit. That's we could set an some. We, they, I, I mean, the, the most we could do is set some recommended priorities, but that really doesn't restrict that money. No. Right. So it depends on our comfort. It, it depends on our comfort level of, of of letting the administration deploy that where they see priorities. And Andrew, we might have to defer to you on some of this because you've probably had the most extensive conversations, or whether you want to specifically say, mm -hmm. here are the priorities. Right. For, For example, if a council member had an idea that I don't know that. 50,000 of it goes to overtime for foot patrol. That would be important to specify. Otherwise, it won't go there. So if we got council feedback tonight about there's really strong priorities you'd like to see in that money, um, we could have that in there. We could, and we could actually do that after the public hearing if you yes. if you expect that there are people that are going to be there commenting on some priorities. That it still wouldn't bind the administration, but at least would voice what exactly the intent was. It could. It could bind, depending if, on how yeah, specific I mean, we you, are. If you knew that, for example, half of the money, if you knew that you wanted to spend half of the money on policing, whatever that policing term looks like, mm -hmm. you would allocate it in the police department budget and it would be deployed by the police department. Um, so I think that's just okay. a question for you guys to figure out. Or if you wanted to leave it flexible on purpose mm -hmm. and allow the administration to figure it out over the next few weeks, then okay. but then that means, you know, the consequence of that is that the council has less say. Sure. So, so the intent is tonight after, if we have time, hopefully we'll, we will close it up. Okay. Thanks, Jennifer. Thanks. But you're still, no, it's Allison. 
Allison's here. We're on to item number seven, legislative intents and interim study items. I think the whole, I'm not going to speak for you, Allison, but you'd like to see us whittle it down, legislative intents, so that if it's something that you really want to see happen, let's keep it on. But if it's something that you're okay with, it won't, but it, let's, let's get rid of it so it doesn't bog us down in moving forward. Right, pretty much? I think it's important for the legislative intents to include um, as much specificity as possible and, as, and to the extent possible make it clear what the council is expecting from the administration in order to fulfill each intent. So Allison, do you want to take us through this one at a time then? So the first uh, draft legislative intent is on administration metrics and reporting. Uh, there are four, I believe, uh, five, sorry, um, specific items. The first is to suggest metrics in conjunction with the annual budget. So this is asking the administration to provide with the annual budget items by which the council or, or measurements by which the council can assess progress or identify particular problems within specific departments. Um, many of these are all, many departments already do this, but this would, this would make it an intent or uh, show the council's intent to, that we're serious about this, that the council is serious about this. So I guess maybe even better uh, is just to go through it and if there are any objections and we just then the council members can object, and if not, we'll just move on. Read the title and move on? Yep. Terrific. So, the metrics in conjunction with the annual budget, any objections? Uh, B, the six-month check-in with new and interim department directors. C, public services. Can we go to, to B for a second? Who are we talking about here in the check-in, Sam, specifically? Mm -hmm. So it would be any department directors who are new as of this year and mm -hmm. then any who are currently interim because a new uh, director has not yet been named. I'm just wondering if that's going to give enough time for some folks to get anything specific to come back to us with. Within six months, I think if we, that's enough time for somebody to get their feet wet and understand what's going on. Then okay. see Julio here, I'm sure he would say, yeah, I could come and do a quick briefing. Okay. And then the annual opportunity is the budget. Mm -hmm. Yep. So objections to that? So C was public services, D, golf. Establishing some metrics for golf. Objections? E is the Arts Council. Now we're on to number two, fleet funds, <laughs> fleet fund financial sustainability. Have we checked in with the administration on what they consider a reasonable time frame to return a report? We have not. We might be able to now. Here's an interim, inter, er, interim director here, Lisa Schaefer. Um, for the fleet. This is to uh, uh, this is a report back on a plan to achieve financial sustainability of the fleet fund. Um, I don't know if we're doing a study. I don't know if we're um, looking at some different mechanism for projecting out that financial stability, but w what we're asking for is a request that you report back, so uh, I w we don't have a time certain on that. And you're looking for a time certain, uh -huh. not specifically what it is that we're studying? Exactly. How about a time kind of six months? Uh, so October. We're looking, uh, we are November. looking at, at a lot of uh, different ways in which we can more efficiently take care of the fleet for the city. So, so I think it's important that we have this back well in advance of budget conversations for next year. So that I, I agree with that. I agree with that. And I, I, I think that I, I would be very comfortable committing to having a conversation ongoing, right? So if, if we could check in occasionally and I could give you updates on, on the progress that we're making, I am not opposed to that. In fact, I welcome it. So... Um, we are looking at lots of different options, uh, replacement, uh, maintenance, parts, 
uh, you know. Mr. Chair, I would suggest first meeting in November. Yeah, I'm with I'm with you there. So if you're comfortable with sometime in November, that would be great. For Certainly. Checking. Thank you. Council yeah. members, are you good with that? Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. Item three, the impound lot. Yeah, Allison. Yes. Um, under B there, six with the mm -hmm. telephone numbers, staff 24 hours a day. Um, I guess it wouldn't necessarily fit under B, maybe A, but I'm wondering if we want to place some something about the the maximum fee as it says in in I I and two about if you access your vehicle if you need to get your vehicle back um, outside of business hours. So yeah, I'm not being very clear. I guess if someone has their vehicle impounded at 11 a.m. and they got to be to work at se or 11 at night and they need to be to work at seven in the morning and they want to pick their vehicle up in the middle of the night, right after it's been impounded. Mm -hmm. uh, we're, are we ensuring through this that they can do so? That is the intent. And uh, then are we doing anything in here or do we have the correct language in here to ensure that um, they know what they will be charged to do that outside of regular business hours, that that is predictable and documented? My understanding is that those fees are actually set by the state, the maximum. Uh, but Lisa's back. I am back. You are correct. <laughs> uh, the fees uh, that um, any impound lot is allowed to charge uh, are regulated by the state. And so, yes, we would include the ability for a person to pick up their vehicle, but the fees themselves would be dictated by the state. And so, yes, and, and yes, to answer your question more directly, we would be able to include that in any contract language that we have um, with any provider of that service. So do I remember, uh, Stan, that you were talking about some gouging that, that can happen in these off hours? And One of the challenges is that the, the regulation is by the state, but there's no recourse. Um, there's no system at the state level for a consumer to to complain or, or uh, um, recover additional costs that may be charged above and beyond what the state limit is. And so there's a, uh, there's a real sort of shadowy area about what is a regulated cost and what I can charge you for off hours and what I can charge you for processing or meeting you or I'm a whole host of additional add-ons. And so those are not well regulated by the state. And it's very difficult for recourse. So, that's so do we have the authority then? With it as a state, I think piece of I think one statute. of the the opportunities we have, which I'm intrigued with, is rather than going to an RFP contract, is saying here are our minimum requirements in order to be considered as part of our rotation. Right. Uh, for for and I think that might be a more interesting tool. So we might want to capture that as an option as we're looking at our intent language that we may not. We may want to explore something broader than an RFP for a specific provider. We may want to provide a set of criteria that we'll, we, we require of anyone that we put in our rotation. Are you implying that the criteria would include some price stipulations? Good, yes. And I think that's the intent of our language. My concern is if every time we defer to the state, I don't think it's sufficient. And... Um, I'm sorry, I forgot my question. Well, I like that idea as well, Aaron and Stan. I like the recourse we have, and then if we have somebody on the on the city level who is an intermediary in some ways who can actually monitor that rotation. So real time, this weekend we had a problem with this operator. They deal with it that weekend or that Monday as a recourse or they're not in the rotation. Uh, I think it gives more immediate, instead of a one-year contract where you can screw up for you months and months. It gives a more immediate sort of recourse, I think. Even if we have problems like that about they have a hidden fee or something that comes up, at least we know about it real time. Maybe not for me that night, but within a day or two, 
the city knows and we can take some action on that, that operator. Yeah, those. I mean, we definitely have the same concern and, and, and that intent. So we'll be working with our legal team. In fact, you know, tomorrow morning is like the first thing on my agenda. So we'll be going through that uh, process to determine what it is that we can, in fact, place into either ordinance or some kind of stipulation like we're talking about for the approved list of uh, towing companies that we would allow to participate in our system and then how we can regulate them is the conversation. Anything else on impound labs? Should I stick around? You might as well. <laughs> <laughs> for cost analysis for development review team services. Any objections? Clean team, number five. Um, I'm wondering if we might want to expand this intent to include the clean or green team as we uh, suggested that we're not comfortable with that $120,000 funding and that we may need to have almost identical <laughs> uh, intent, uh, grant opportunities, matching funds, um, other funding sources, so. Did, did I understand, so this would be for future years, my understanding was that the green team was not funded for this year. That's correct, it's not funded for this year, but I think the opportunities, it feels to me like the opportunities are similar. Okay. We're looking at contracting with an outside entity to uh, hire people to do cleaning or growing. It's a job training program. Am I off here? It feels like this could, this criteria could apply to either of those programs. They're very similar okay. programs. Okay. I would support that. Number six is the EDCU contract. Number seven is a briefing on the PERF study, defining success and responding to sexual violence. Number eight, periodic study of public safety compensation. That it would be every three years. Because I don't see it on here. I don't see yes, it. Yes, it's in the right. second first line. line. First sentence. It is the intent of the council oh. to request that every three years the administration. Great. Da, da, da. Thank you. And that does it for this year's legislative intents. The next section uh, it are the uh, recommendations of the staff for past year's intents. Mr. Chair, I don't know if you'd like to go through those. Number one would remain open. And 14. And is one open because we haven't received the information or are we still in process with the state? Do you there, know? There are actually two components to it. One is that there was an attempt by the city to change legislation and that, in, um, and that attempt was not successful. So one question would be whether the council wanted that to continue. The other is if the council would like more information on the state pre-disaster pre mitigation grant um, at this time. But our understanding is that the administration is currently applying for that grant. Has currently applied for it? Yes. Um, if they've applied for it, then did we, we really don't They are currently applying for applying it. Applying for it. Yes. Okay. So then why don't we just skip last year's 2015-16 legislative intent statements for in August or September, July, somewhere in there. Just like Okay, follow up in, yep. in August. Yep, that way we can just move right on. Must be dinner time. We're getting there, yep. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you, Allison, appreciate it. Um, we're moving on to item number eight. We're right on time with the building height in downtown secondary central business district. Zoning text amendment. We have Russell Weeks from council staff. And Nick Norris from the planning department.
Okay, Russell. Oh, well, Mr. Chair. Can you remind us why this came back and give us ideas <laughs> so everybody knows why we're talking about it again? Uh, Mr. Chair, I, I thought we'd use this time to go over the proposed motions for the uh, Excuse me. Uh, for the issue, and see if if uh, one stands out against any of the others. Um, okay. How would you like me to proceed? Do you want me to read the, all five motions? Um, number five, I don't think we need to read. Okay. But I would do the four. Okay. Um, motion number one would be to adopt the proposed ordinance, which is uh, uh, the bottom line on that is um, is a 120 foot design review at 120 feet. Uh, no cap on uh, no, no, no maximum height on there. And um, well, that's basically it, and would apply. It would apply to uh, the blocks bordered by South Temple, West Temple, 200 South, and 200 West. That's motion number one. Motion number two would be like motion number one, except it would set a maximum height at 425 feet. Motion number three would be like motions number one and two, except that it would set a maximum height limit of 375 feet. Motion number four would be like motion number one, which means uh, uh, no, no maximum height limit, but it would limit the, excuse me, <coughs> It would limit the um, the location where the zoning would take effect to the south half of the uh, blocks bordered by South Temple, West Temple, 200 South, 200 West. So there would be like an imaginary line drawn between where 100 South ends at the Salt Palace on the east side and begins at the, uh, begins again on the west side of uh, 200 West. Mr. Chair. Yes. So which, and I've received this question from a couple of different people, um, regarding uh, Japantown and the temple, um, what, will any of these impact that location? Not to my knowledge. Okay. That, was, that, was, my, that them, was my understanding as well. None of them are on the back side of that. Right. And, at, and at one point, the Royal Woods property yeah. was, being, was considered, being considered, and that's, that's not, not in this. Okay, I just, I wanted, I, that's what I figured, but I wanted to state it because I know that there's quite a bit of anxiety about that. Um, but this will not impact those areas. Go ahead, Molly. Uh, well, as, as long as any development happens along West Temple and not uh, second west. Um, the rezone would go up to the property line on second west, but there's no plans that we know of from the county to develop that side of the Salt Palace. It wouldn't be in their interest, um, in part because of the solar panels that are on the roof of the convention center, that investment that they've made there. They want to make sure that those are not shadowed, so therefore the shadow wouldn't impact um, First South, where the uh, Buddhist temple and the Japanese church are. Does the south corner, the southeast corner, not does that not impact the solar panel on the no, roof of the salt the, palace? The uh, panels are more on the western half of the salt palace building. They're not over what would be the ballroom. No. Um, the adjacent corners in the downtown core, what's the height limit on those? Uh, so if we're looking at the, uh, across the street corners, um, typically a corner in the uh, downtown zone is a, a height limit of what? 375. 375. 
but, but they can exceed that if right. they go through the design review process, and there's no there's no upper limit. Sure. To that. So the the so the but it requires design review over one one twenty five. Over three seventy five on the corners and a hundred feet mid block in the D one. In the D one, okay. So what, the, Russell? One of the suggestions you were making was in the um, motion three that I, that was the three seventy five feet, correct? But it also requires a design review because it's over one hundred twenty five feet. Is that correct? That is my belief that that is correct. And is that the belief of the planning department? <laughs> so. so. Currently in the D4, the trigger for design review is 75 feet in the D4. So anything between 75 feet and 120 feet is required to go through the design review process. So um, for the two blocks that we're talking about, if they wanted to exceed 120 feet, then that's the that's the that's the big question that we're we're trying to get to is what height do we do you want do you want a specific height? Do you not want a specific height over 120? But knowing that the trigger would actually be 75 feet for a design um, review. Well, is that for design is, review? Is that only in the middle of the block or even on the corners? Uh, well, for this uh, proposal, it's for the whole block, not regardless just the of corner. where it's located. Yes, so the D4 is 75 feet. In the D4, it's 75 feet, whether it's on the corner or middle, the middle of the block. So yes. that's the trigger related to the D4. Yes. And so I, I'm okay, um, Lisa, with that trigger remaining in there, but I'm just uh, wondering about the height limitation. And I think 375 is reasonable, um, and I think that was one of the big concerns expressed last week was just unlimited height, which is what basically in the D1 you're unlimited height, but you would be uh, susceptible to design review too over that 375 amount. Is that correct? In the D1, yes. Yes. So right across the street. Um, the uh, yeah. Okay, I think that. Well, can I make a comment? Just looking at motion four, it doesn't seem to include the comment about conditional building and site design review. So um, the other motions have par alterations to paragraph eight A and eight A one. Motion four does not include eight A one. In it. So my my uh, expectation, council members, I'll, I'll I'll just sort of say where I am. I think that's uh, okay. I, I'm inclined to go with motion number three, but I would like to add probably some intent that the county thoroughly explore the site location um, on the south end as well, because I know that the intent when they came to us was for that uh, Yumoka location, um, but I think the county, I think the mayor is receptive to looking again at that south corner location. So if we added intent language, I don't want to constrain the ordinance, but if we added intent language to motion number three, I would be really comfortable with that. Mr. Chair. Yes, Chair Lee. Um, Stan, would you be willing to also add um, in some intent language? I just don't know what exactly it would say regarding um, the Japanese church and the Buddhist temple. Absolutely. I, I don't think. I don't think it's going to impact yeah. it just based on what you've said, but I think if, if there are some assurances. Sure. Given, I think that might. So, that Russell, might help. can you help me with that during our dinner break, just to uh, do a couple of components of that intent language, which is for the county to explore that south end, and that we uh, have assurances that we're, our intent is not to impact um, the properties uh, west of 200 West. Mr. Chair. Uh, Charlie, and then Aaron. Uh, okay. May I, may I respond? respond? To Sten's request first, I would would uh, on that second intent would would something like uh, the it is the intent of the city council that the county avoid any impacts to the uh, uh, right. to the west side of the property. properties yeah. uh, west right. of 200 west. Yeah. Is that something that you're looking at? I okay. think that okay. covers it. Yeah, okay. that, I think that would be very sufficient. Okay. Thanks, Russell. Okay. So, uh, a question regarding motion number two and the 425 foot high limit. Is that was that based on um, my question to you, or is that based on something else? 
No, that was that was based on your question. That was based on, okay. So at this point, I'll just say um, I am not supporting that at this point. I think that um, you know after more thought and discussion with the county, I think the 375 foot height limit um, is more than sufficient. So. Um, I figured that that one was in there because of my question. I just wanted to state that I'm, I'm not going to be making that motion, that I think 375 is, uh, is more than adequate. And motion number four was mine, but with the wording that Stan put in there, I'm completely fine with, that, with the polling motion four. Okay. Aaron. Nick, those changes that we made to the CBSDR, Related to the CB zoning back in February, would those come into play in any of these? Okay. No, those we added those things specifically in the CB zoning district. Only for CB. Thank you. Uh, I believe the 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 building on the corner across the street from the north end is 375 feet. Is that correct? For 91, 99 West. Yeah, it's 375. Yes. Is that correct? Um, 375. It's 375. Yeah. So effectively, the, if it goes to that north corner, this doesn't do anything to mitigate the concerns. I mean, really, is that accurate? And can you build the the size hotel that wants to be built on the footprint they have at that height, the number of rooms? Uh, yes. Uh, yeah, probably. I mean, I, if, what it comes down to really is is the footprint and it's the additional meeting space, how big that ends up being and if mm -hmm. they can stack it vertically. And there's a lot of technical things that are gonna play into the height um, and everything else, but it's it's possible. I, I think if one of, one of the impacts that happens when you when you limit the height is that you expand the floor plate. Yeah. So you get more room for floor and so you end up with a wider building at least on one dimension. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, that's just the reality of building heights, right? Sure. I agree. I have concerns about the north end, but doing a 375 with a contingency that you can go higher if, if needs be doesn't mitigate any problems on that end of the th block whatsoever. Um, you're okay with mitigation? So I suggesting the feedback I'm getting, I'm hearing from the county, is they're okay with 375 feet. Sure, I'm talking with the neighbors there going across the street, um, the same height as the building, as the tallest building right there. I mean, it's. Theoretically, on that north end. If you go to the south end, it's a whole different ballgame. We have no control over that piece. So, the uh, the component that gives me some comfort in this process is that the, well, this is one of the stronger design review opportunities we have in the downtown area. And so, um, the um, intent is to mitigate a couple of things. One of the things that we've talked about all through this uh, process from the beginning was a concern that. This is a pretty significant structure downtown, and it was important that it had really good orientation to the street and to other components of the downtown uh, core. And I think this gives us that opportunity, but I also think it looks gives us the opportunity to look at other mitigation as mm -hmm. well. So, yeah, I mean, Mike, if the concern was the unlimited height question, this has nothing to address that because really, unlimited height, 375 feet, is the equivalent to unlimited height on that corner for all the neighbors. Now, the higher, the higher doesn't really matter at that point. Right? I guess my f fundamental concern is that if, if we start um, not building any more tall buildings downtown, we're going to have a whole host of different problems. Well, sure. But, sure. Um, uh, I mean, I, I hate to suggest, you know, it's a first in, <laughs> last in sort of, um, you know, I'm concerned about the precedent set for uh, protecting views in a downtown core, which was seemed to be the the primary mm -hmm. concern, I'm not sufficiently convinced that this obstructs a view. I think that it adds a component to the view, um, which is, uh, in my view, a relatively uh, expected component in a downtown area, which is another building. So, well, I think that's true. But I also think that if the original zoning was to cut it off at that street and say, "Here's core east, here's not core west." the understanding from developers was very different than this is going to propose. So I'm not saying we, we shouldn't look at it. I, I have concerns that we're not addressing the, the concerns of the neighborhood unless we can do it through the design review process. But at 375, it's the same as unlimited. Mr. Right Chair, um, 
what you're saying is true as far as it may as well be as high as they want, but I have some comfort in that it will not be blocking their view because it's not going to go, anything that high is not going to go directly across the street from them on the plaza in front of a Bravenel Hall. It would be to the south of that plaza, and so it might block some views of Kennecott Copper or part of, part of the Ochre Mountains, but it would not be straight on view to the west that they couldn't see the west at all. And, and I think it's going to be much more of a sliver. And if any of the other sites are selected, they're all south of that. So I, I feel good about that. And I can't imagine the day when Salt Lake would be okay with blocking a Bravenel Hall when that's a signature building in our downtown. And that, that I think that plaza will always be there. So I'm, I'm comfortable with that. And don't feel like we're making it so you can't see anything from 99. Do you want to add anything else? The only thing I have to add, Mr. Chair, is uh, we'll prepare a motion based on, on, on motion three and include the two intents and hopefully uh, get with Council Member Penfold and agree on the language to the legislative intents. Okay, great. Any other questions? Okay, really appreciate you three and all your work on this. Uh, we have one more that you've worked really hard on, too. A little hard. Which is <laughs> number nine. A little bit it's the Sugar House Streetcar. Quarter master plan and zoning amendment. Um, everyone is still here at the table, except Molly. We'll see you later. Thanks. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't know if Marianne is here. She's, She's actually at a conference. So great, Nick. You're the man. All right, Russell. Same thing, right? Uh, yes, I had hoped to use this time to to go through the motions with with the council, see if uh, you're okay with the motions. Uh, clearly, um, the the council specifically said it was would continue the public hearing until tonight. Uh, there may be some people we already have had some public comment. Um, so, uh, you, the council has the option either to close the public hearing or to continue it. If you close the public hearing, then you uh, have the option of. Uh, adopting one of two proposed ordinances. <clears throat> Motion number one would be to adopt the amended alternate ordinance. And that motion would include uh, changing the building height, uh, changing the maximum building height from 75 feet to 60 feet, allowing an additional 15 feet in height for a total of 75 feet uh, for residential uses if a minimum of 10% of the uh, units are affordable housing. The, the difference between that one and the original proposed ordinance is, is that the original proposed ordinance still places the uh, maximum building height at 75 feet with an additional 30 feet. Uh, for uh, residential uses if, if a minimum of 20% of the units are affordable housing. The other proposed changes would be to uh, uh, really would, would be to amend one word in uh, uh, paragraph one uh, of section one paragraph B titled amending the text of the Sugar House master plan and instead of uh, the sentence that reads specific projects include it would be amended to read specific projects may include and then uh, underneath that same section under policies there would be three sentences eliminated one would be work with the Utah Department of Transportation to eliminate the right-hand travel lanes along 700 East between 2100 South and 700 East Streetcar Station and replace the travel times with on-street parking and bike lane. Connect Green Street to Wilmington Avenue to eliminate the dead end at the south end of Green Street and redevelop the city-owned open space property located on the southeast corner of 900 East and Sugarmont Drive into a transit supportive development. Redevelopment of the property should include sidewalk improvements that support a walkable and active development. Again, all three of those paragraphs would be eliminated in the 
alternate ordinance. The second motion available for the council consideration is to adopt the ordinance originally proposed in the administration's transmittal. That would mean a, a maximum height of 75 feet. Uh, and the way, the way staff prepared these ordinances, the uh, changes to section one, paragraph B, uh, meaning the word change and the elimination of the three paragraphs would remain in the original ordinance. That clearly can be amended if the council's uh, inclined to go with the original ordinance. Uh, and obviously the third motion is to not adopt an ordinance at all. Now, one final, one final motion is available for the council's consideration, and that is a, uh, uh, a legislative intent that a petition be initiated to amend form-based urban neighborhood to zone in the zoning ordinance so that interior side yard and rear yard setback requirements and upper level step back requirements are not dependent on adjacency to areas zoned as form-based urban neighborhood one zones. The, the goal of that legislative intent is, is to uh, uh, respond to uh, public comment at the at the at the public hearing uh, in in May about about wanting to have uh, the same sort of setback requirements uh, that are available in FB in form based urban neighborhood one zones. Uh, they want the 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 pub, uh, pub speakers wanted the setback requirements available there to also be available, well, no, setbacks in form-based urban neighborhood, well, yes. They wanted the same requirements in the form-based urban neighborhood two zones. To be available elsewhere in the city, right, without yeah. having to have That's, one to do two? That is, is that correct. Right? So it's being responsive to that. Mr. Chair, um, I just would say, uh, these changes are responsive to the feedback that we received uh, at the public hearing and as well as um, via email and comments from the Sugar House community. And I really appreciate all the hard work that Russell and the legal team have done to get this done quickly for us and to be so responsive to what the people who live in that area have said. Lisa, the, yeah. and I would just, for my clarification, Sugar House Community Council supported the amended alternative ordinance. Is that correct? The which? Or, or Sugar House Community Council. Okay. They spoke in favor of the proposal, but it was the alternative ordinance they were speaking in favor of, correct? They, they gave a, a lukewarm, um, land use gave lukewarm approval, but they weren't thrilled with the 105 feet, and when they realized we could lower it, then there was a lot of enthusiasm about that. Uh, Mr. Chair, I believe the elements that are included in the alternative ordinance were one suggested by in, in, by the Community Council. Yeah. Okay. By the community that, council. Good, yeah. That's my question. Yeah, that's it. Sorry. Okay. Thanks for clarifying. Thank you very sorry. much. Yeah. And, and thank you all, yes, again, yeah. to echo Lisa. This has been a long time coming, and, and thank you for that intense work in that process. Mr. Chair? Yes, Andrew? We got another email from another business owner who had another proposed development that said it wouldn't pencil out at this lower height, which is directly opposed to what I heard earlier that was reversed, that things would pencil better at this height. Uh, it's, yeah, it's, and doing 10% instead of 20%. Um, the one of the people who contacted us via email wanted 135 feet. So well, the, the one I'm, I'm referring to was they wanted the 75 up to 105 because their development was contingent on that size and they couldn't do it for a lower amount. They they can do it, they could do it for 75 feet. They weren't going to go to the 105 because they didn't want to do the still construction. Is my understanding and conversations with them, not not in the email, but uh, I think it gives other still the opportunity is there. So the, the I think the real issue is up to 75 feet. It's podium. It's wood on podium. Above 75 feet, it goes to steel. And so if someone wants to do a steel project, it doesn't pencil here at all. Yeah. Um, yeah, so we are saying that we don't want steel here. We want 
you know, what well, we may want in. still there, but we want some affordable housing. Right. There. So. Probably so, yeah, it would include the the old old proposal would have allowed for some steel construction going up, but the question what we're seeing throughout the city, even in areas where the height allows for steel, we're not seeing steel, we're seeing wood on podium. So uh, one one point of clarification, Mr. Chair, the uh, one of the other concerns by one of the property owners is that uh, requiring the affordable housing component le lends a level of uncertainty to their project and they'd rather, you know, if I may paraphrase, uh, they would feel better if, if, if they could, if, if the project could go forward to 75 feet without the affordable housing component. So that's a, that's a choice before the city council. So, uh, any other questions? Well, we have staff here. Nick, I don't see Nora here, but on behalf of the council, this started when I first came on council, and it'll be nice to finally see it done. Before first, that, was, before, was before we before. came on. I, I, I have known it for the past, what? Yeah. So I really appreciate it, Nick. Thank you. All of your help, your, your work and your staff's work and everyone involved. This has been a long time coming. And Russell, I know that you're excited to see this. Put to, put to bed, right? <clears throat> it's, it's not done yet, actually. But uh, one more hand-wringing point. If you're inclined to adopt the amended ordinance, it's motion number one. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. We appreciate it. All right, council members, we are on to the report and announcements from Cindy Gus Jensen. Okay, this should be easy. We have a request from Council Member Lisa Adams to initiate a text amendment to the city's zoning ordinance pertaining to historic signs. And um, I'm assuming you already had two people to support this, so yes. we wanted to check to see if uh, there's support from the council to move this forward. The next step would be a motion on a formal council agenda. And I, I, that, this was so long ago. Um, I'm presuming that the text amendment is to allow um, signs to be taken down to be repaired and then put back up because the problem has been there's been this loophole that you can't restore a sign um, if you take it off the property to repair it, then it can't go back up. So that was sort of a mistake in terms of trying to do that. So I, I think that's what this text amendment is about. That's my recollection. There are four bullet points there. So. Okay, thank you. Okay, so moving it ahead, is that correct? Okay. Uh, no, as long, as long as there's no objection. Okay. Well, I mean, it says more than that. It says you can move it as well to another part of your piece in your property. Is that problematic for anyone? The, uh, I'm okay with it because a recommendation have come back from the planning department. We can have that discussion about whether or not we want to allow them to move it as well. So I'm and, okay with them exploring that. And sometimes so. if the building has been changed, mm -hmm. then it can't go in the exact same location but on property. But we'll have that discussion when it sure. comes back. Sometimes we've had a matter of a few feet in either direction that was a problem. But uh, My grandparents moved a big obelisk out of a cornfield into their backyard, original site of the his first house in Hooper, Utah. So everyone went to the pilgrimage to the backyard of the house when it wasn't really there. <laughs> got but it. it got maintained at that point, so. <laughs> okay. Um, then the ground transportation rates, you, um, this is a good example of how, how you can do things in different ways with your consolidated fee schedule. You have delegated authority to the airport to do uh, urgent ground transportation regulation, and the airport authority director can establish temporary rate restrictions. And what has uh, been the case in the past is that there's been a flat rate instituted uh, since the um, previous ground transportation regulations don't apply at this point. So the, what's pr being proposed is that this rate continue. There's a uh, requirement that you put in that 
every four months they check back with you. So you have 60 days to either accept or reject this. If you take no action, they will assume that you have accepted it. So this is a request to continue the current status with the, um, the uh, maximum rate uh, into the city. No objection. I've gotten feedback from people in my neighborhood that feel shortchanged by it. Because they would like a similar restriction? Well, they'd say they pay the same amount to go a you know, five minute drive from the airport that somebody would to go another part of town, essentially. So, yeah. Well, it, it splits it to fifth, uh, fifth east, I believe. Street or seventh east? I, I don't remember which. A uh, maximum of $25 fare for up to two passengers for destinations two and including Fifth East. 500 East Street. Yeah. So mm -hmm. you would want to suggest that they establish a maximum on the west side that isn't just the citywide? I'm not sure I'd go that far, but... Okay. Uh, uh, we could find out more. For the sake of simplification, I understand why this comes in, but it also means it's, it's not exactly a flat rate, but it's pretty close for a lot of folks in the city. We could ask for more information to see if they've considered that or anything. We'll come yeah. back to you. Okay. okay. Thanks, everyone. Great. Thank you, Cindy. Um, that is it for this evening. We have uh, dinner is on the, the liaison's table, and we will adjourn until 7 o'clock across the hall. And there's birthday cake for birthday people and their friends. James is yesterday and Aaron's tomorrow. <laughs>